You are listening to Craved Mate, Wolf Shifter Rom-Com Romance, Book 6, in the Cybermate series. Written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Maeve York. Chapter 1. Mel I don't like this shit one bit. Adam's Hummer swerved across two lanes of traffic, nearly clipping the front end of a small Toyota, as we swung onto the airport exit ramp. The Toyota honked, and Adam hollered a string of curses through the closed driver's side window. My knuckles were white as my fingers squeezed the door handle. I prayed we ended up at the airport, not the morgue. I just need a vacation, Adam. From singing? His derisive snort niggled under my skin. And from snide comments like that. I had a fleeting but delightful image of my leg swinging up and the toe of my boot lodging itself in his throat. It isn't right, Melody. Abruptly, he pulled off to the shoulder of the road and brought the SUV to a halt. An angry horn blared. Adam flipped them the bird, then turned to face me with the same cross look and negative energy. It isn't right for my girlfriend to go traipsing off on a vacation without me. A furtive glance at the display on my phone told me I needed to be at the TSA gate in the next ten minutes if I wanted to make my flight. I had no time to placate Adam by listening to another of his sophomoric tantrums. It's not just a vacation, Adam. I wouldn't be going if not for my job. The band is counting on me. Adam shook his head. No. I won't allow it. I'm turning around. My eyes narrowed, my face contorted into a threatening glower. Drive, or I'll get out and walk. We stared each other down for several seconds. Finally, after an exasperated and overly dramatic sigh, the SUV shifted into drive and pulled back onto the road, cutting off another driver. Adam sped toward the departure's drop-off area, much too fast, and didn't say another word until his foot slammed hard on the brake pedal, sending me shooting forward with a lurch. We were at the curb in front of double sliding glass doors where travelers catching domestic flights hugged, kissed, and said their goodbyes to friends and loved ones. Unless they were me, or Adam. You're fucking someone else, aren't you? Neither the harsh words nor the accusation was all that shocking coming from him. Not anymore. I scowled. You're kidding, right? Well, what the hell else would I think, Melody? You're running off to the Keys for a gig, a week early, I might add, without giving a single shit about my feelings. We've been together for a year, and you still don't respect my feelings. Why do I even take this shit from you? I don't know, Adam. Why do you take this shit from me? I searched his face, looking for something. Not quite sure what that something was. Love? Attraction? Compassion? Connection? Whatever it was, I didn't find it. I wasn't even sure who was to blame for the lack in our relationship. Him or me. Feelings of lack and lack of feelings. I almost laughed as the thought popped into my head. Fortunately, I was able to keep a lid on my giggles, laughing right now when all I was trying to do was get out of the car and make my flight would be counterproductive. Besides, how could I blame Adam for the hollowness I felt? There's no one else. I have a gig, and I want a little extra vacation time. This is no different from the weddings, bar mitzvahs, and festivals we usually play. Ingrid and the guys will arrive in a couple of days. He reached over and wrapped his fingers around my wrist, squeezing like a vice. When you get back, we're moving in together, right? We're taking this relationship to the next level, as we discussed. A security guard tapped the window, motioning us along, but Adam merely spared a glance, waved him off, and focused his penetrating gaze back on me. His grip was borderline painful. The guard tapped on the window again. Adam ignored him. I've got to go, Adam. I want your answer first. The guard tapped yet again and raised his voice. You need to move along, sir. I struggled in Adam's grip. Let go of me. I'm going to be late. The guard tapped his knuckle on the glass harder this time and shot Adam a harsh glare. 
This isn't a parking lot, sir. Whipping around, Adam rolled his window down. Listen, Robocop, I'm fucking saying goodbye to my girlfriend here. Give me a goddamn minute. When his grip loosened, I saw my chance and took it. Before he could protest, I freed myself and my suitcase, leaped out of the SUV, and without a backward glance, my feet ate up the pavement into the departure's terminal. Chapter 2 Mac Come on, dead weight. I hoisted my sister's maid up and helped him into the wheelchair he'd recently started using to get around. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were getting fat on purpose just to give my guns a workout. Warren lifted his frail arm and extended his bony middle finger. Right here. I bit back a grin and leaped out of his way as he attempted to run over my toes with his chair. You wish. My eyes followed him. He wheeled himself into the kitchen and opened the fridge door. Loaf of bread, jar of mayo, pack of sliced turkey breast. One by one, he placed the items on his lap. My fists balled at my sides to keep from interfering, but I watched him like a hawk for signs of excess fatigue. He was about to fade. Despite our verbal banter, I cared deeply for my sister's mate. He was a damn good man. He and Heather were still madly in love and possessed a connection deeper than I'd ever seen shared between two people. Human men weren't built the way we were, though. Warren was fighting cancer, and the chemo was kicking his ass. He looked progressively worse by the day. My heart ached as I watched the once strong, virile man wither to a bony shell. He slumped in his chair, his head drooping forward slightly. I veto your role as sandwich maker. You suck at it. Your sandwiches are like eating a blob of mayo with a side of bread and a meat garnish. I'd rather dine on cat turds. That can be arranged. I snickered, sidestepped him, and slapped together a couple of sandwiches for us. Make sure you bring the mayonnaise jar and a knife with you. Your sandwiches are as dry as the Sahara. He slowly wheeled himself to his empty spot and, with effort, rested his arms atop the table. Fucking hell. I slid his plate in front of him and followed his angry gaze. Through the window, I saw his daughter, my niece, Jenny, scantily clad and standing in the driveway draped over the latest punk in a long line of punk-ass boyfriends. Son of a bitch. When she swung her leg over and climbed on the back of current punk's motorcycle, I moved fast. I was out the door and just barely caught the back of her sweater before they took off. Jenny jerked out of my grip, growling. What the fuck? I leveled a menacing glare at the current punk ass. Move this bike and it's a mangled heap of scrap metal. Uncle Mac, knock it off. I looked down at the young woman who, just yesterday it seemed, had been a sweet, innocent, bright-eyed little girl dressing up her dolls and serving me tea in her miniature china tea set. Where's Am? In her room. In her room. She's a baby, Jenny. You can't just leave her in her room alone. She's not alone. You're here babysitting, Dad. Jenny wrapped her arms around the punk's middle, her cheek resting against his back. I have a date with Joe. You can't expect me to sacrifice my entire life and chain myself to the house like a house elf just because I have a child, Uncle Mac. That's a little harsh. With a couple of taps to Joe's stomach, Jenny signaled him to take off. The motorcycle roared as it sped down the street while I stood staring after them. I spent a few indulgent seconds fantasizing about sitting my niece in time out while I ripped Joe limb from limb until he was nothing but a bloody pulp. I rushed back inside straight to Am's nursery. My sister, Heather, had painted a beautiful mural of baby animals on the walls, and the room had a cheerful, uplifting vibe. Usually, at the moment, it did nothing to cheer or uplift me. Sweet, chubby-cheeked Am, stared up from her crib with bright, curious eyes. She watched the mobile over her bed as it spun fluffy baby zoo animals around and gummed her plump little fingers, drool dribbling down her chin and neck. Come here, Droodlebug. Uncle Max got you. 
I scooped her into my arms and carried her back to the dining room to finish eating lunch with Warren. One look at Am and his face darkened. I don't understand where we went wrong. I bit back my angry comment about my niece and tried to shrug it off. The man had enough on his plate. He didn't need me bad-mouthing his family. I don't know, Warren, but I feel lucky as a pig in a mud puddle getting to spend time cuddling this chubby little doodle bug. I wiggled my finger against her ribs, and she responded with a three-toothed giggle. Warren slid his sandwich away. He'd only taken a single bite. Hand her to me. You eat, I've got her. I sat her little diapered butt on the table and took a bite of my sandwich before bopping the tip of my finger to Am's nose. I am capable of holding my own fucking granddaughter, Mac. I'm not dead yet. His hoarse growl belied his frustration at his situation. Warren was a proud man, a strong man. He'd withstood so much already, and life was still beating the shit out of him. You're not going to die, asshole. Not on my watch. I forbid it. I am not putting up with my sister if anything happens to you. So pull your head right on out of that shadowy place and eat your fucking sandwich. I growled back at him, my wolf growl far more menacing than his human growl. I'll hand her over when she's done playing with her favorite uncle. I turned to Am. You want to be with Uncle Mac, don't you? Yes, you do. He yanked his sandwich back and made a production of taking a huge bite. His narrowed eyes were on me, anger oozing from his pores. I didn't care. I could take it, and I knew most of that anger wasn't about me anyway. There are days I'd like to kick your ass back to Ohio. There are days I'd like you to shut the fuck up. Wish in one hand. I played a tickle game with Am, poking my finger into the belly of her pink frilly dress and accompanying it with a squeak like she was the Pillsbury Doughboy. It made her laugh every time. Why does your mommy insist on dressing you like this? It's Heather's doing. She did the same damn thing to Jenny, dressed her up like a china doll from the day she came home from the hospital. A rare sweet memory of my niece surfaced. I remember. She was in pink lace and ruffles until she turned 10 and finally learned to put her foot down. I wish she'd learned to pick it back up once in a while. Warren sighed. My daughter's head is not on right. No disagreement for me. When her family needed her most, her parents and her nine-month-old daughter, she was so wrapped up in her own selfishness that not only was she not a help, she was a hindrance. She treated her ailing father like a burden and hurled a disrespectful attitude at her mother and at everyone else within her immediate vicinity. My temper began to spike just thinking about it, and I looked for a way to diffuse it. Want to see if there's a game on TV? Warren laughed, the sound so rare these days that it was sweeter to my ears than a Beethoven concerto. Hell yeah, you're finally becoming tolerable to have around. Thought the day would never come. I waited until he swallowed another bite of his sandwich before I handed Am to him. Weariness and stress showed in his eyes. Warren was in no shape to take on the responsibilities of being a dad to a youngster again. He needed to focus his strength and energy on himself and his health. Heather needed to focus hers on her mate and herself. Jenny was going to get a piece of my mind when I caught up to her. Well, you coming, old man? I grabbed the handles of his chair and wheeled him, with Am on his lap, to the living room. I think the octogenarians at the old folks' home move faster than you. What's the big rush, Bow Wow? In a hurry to chase your tail or can't wait to lick your testicles? Chapter 3. Mel The bell over the door rang as I entered the B&B. &B. A young man in his late teens sitting behind the front desk offered me a friendly smile. Welcome to Rise and Shine, Bed and Breakfast. I'm Jacob. You must be... He scanned the computer screen in front of him. Miss Melody Cameron. Call me Mel. Nice to meet you, Jacob. He reached out and I slipped my hand in his for a quick shake before he stood and rounded the desk. We've already got all your information, so I'll just show you to your room. 
Mom put you in the swan suite. It's our honeymoon suite, but when she heard that you're performing at the Richardson Bennett wedding, she wanted to spoil you. They're personal friends. He led me down a hallway and through a set of swinging doors. It's pretty sweet, excuse the pun. There's a private patio leading out onto the beach with a jacuzzi. My hand flew to my heart. Your mom is an angel from heaven, he snorted. A demon from hell, maybe, but only on a good day. Then he looked back at me with wide eyes. Don't tell her I said that, it was a joke. I patted his shoulder reassuringly. Secret's safe with me. Jacob showed me around the suite that had a spectacular view of the water. Well, have a pleasant stay. Breakfast is served from 6.30 to 11 every morning, and you'll see Marvin shuffling around here and there. He'll help with anything else you might need. Jacob paused at the door, looked over his shoulder, and winked. Or you could ring me, since he's like 200 years old and I'm always available. Flirt. My phone rang right as I finished unpacking my small valise. Hi, Ingrid. Yes, I made it safely. Hello, love. Pleased to hear it. I hope you're enjoying yourself. I'm so sorry your boyfriend is a gnarled pecker. I know, as your supportive best friend, I'm not supposed to tell you that, and I do apologize, but in the interest of brutal honesty, he is a gnarly, deformed, gonorrhea-riddled, pus-dripping knob. My teeth sank into my lip to keep from laughing. Ingrid was never subtle about her feelings concerning Adam, or anything else for that matter, and her British accent always seemed to add to her already humorous outlook. What did he do this time? Besides glaring at me as though I was the doggy doo-doo he stepped in? Well, there was the bandying about of loud comments regarding our band's ineptitude and our clumsy, amateurish execution. So, basically, he belittled everything joyful and worthwhile about our existence. Oh, Ingrid, I'm sorry. It's not your fault, he's a peckerhead. But why are you with him again? I let out a tired sigh. Don't start. You know I hate the thought of getting old all alone. Bloody hell, Mel. Where do you think I'll be as you grow old? Probably busy with your future husband and future family. Bollocks. I'll be right beside you. We're a team. Where are you, by the way? In the loo. I told Rita I needed to poo. This time, I couldn't contain my sharp burst of laughter. What if they hear you talking? What if they don't, and I'm stuck at this job for the rest of my miserable days? A reality, I might add, which is far more frightening than being elderly and single. Her heavy exhale shot a staticky rattle through my phone. I should have told Shark Mummy and Guppy Boy to sod off and hopped on the plane with you. That had been our original plan, until Ingrid was unable to get the time off. Selfishly, I wish you had. Well, there is a silver lining. Arriving the morning of the wedding gets me a seat on a flight next to Pierce. Her wistful little sigh was almost sad. Do you think your brother will ever notice that I grew knockers and an arse? Gag. I hope not. Hey, you're supposed to be in my corner and want the best for me. I am, and I do, which is why I don't want you hooking up with Pierce. I wouldn't allow it to get messy. I mean, other than in the bedroom, no holds bar there. The toilet flushed in the background. I guess it's back to the grind for me. His royal man baby and queen stick up a bum await their overworked office peon. This job will be the death of me. You'll die faster of starvation. I've got a little meat on my bones. Bye, Ingrid. Love you. Call me later. Something about Ingrid's mix of perpetual pessimism and dry humor always lightened my mood. I felt horrible that she was stuck in a job she hated, and I would never tell her, but another reason I continued to make my relationship with Adam work was for her sake. 
As petty and vindictive as he and his mother were, a messy breakup between Adam and me would surely involve Ingrid. They'd use her to retaliate, and I had no wish to see her become a victim of collateral damage. Our band gigs were sufficient income for me, since I had a decent-sized investment portfolio and a low-key lifestyle. Ingrid, however, lived from check to check with little left over at the end of the month. She needed that job. I hung up, slung my small crossbody bag over my shoulder, and headed out to do the touristy thing. A stroll down the road, running through the center of town and bisecting the island, revived me. Blue sky, salty ocean breeze, small shops lining Main Street. This was what a vacation should look like. But the sun's rays were fierce. The road split at one point to accommodate a massive oak tree and the small grassy patch of earth around it. It was the first non-palm tree I'd seen on the island, and a wooden bench beneath it looked welcoming. The old tree offered shade from the blazing sun. I stood near the bench and aimed my phone at the underside of the branches, intending to capture the tree's beauty from a unique angle for a vacation photo album I planned to put together when I returned to Syracuse. That was when I heard a tiny, little meow. So helpless, so despondent, the sound made my heart ache. I blinked against the rays of dappled sunlight streaming through the branches and searched until I spotted calico fur. There was a cat stuck on one of the branches. It was bigger than I thought it would be and not up excessively high, although to say I was no fan of heights was putting it mildly. I called out to it. Here, kitty kitty. I made kissing sounds. I cooed and cajoled and coaxed, but it didn't budge. Standing back to judge the distance from the ground to the cat's perch made me shudder. Nope, no way, not happening, little kitty. I tried again. Here, kitty kitty, please come down, if you can. It didn't work. Poor cat, it was probably terrified. And who could blame it? Climbing a tree was not the best idea I'd ever had either, but I was a bleeding heart where animals were concerned, and I could not in good conscience walk away from a cat stuck in a tree. Even if that was what I probably should have done, what I definitely should have done. I scanned the area, but most people were smart enough to either be on the beach or to have taken cover from the midday island sun somewhere air-conditioned. I was the only other living being nearby. Me and the cat. I blew out a rough breath, stepped up onto the bench, and tried not to think too hard as I clasped the lowest branch and hauled myself up. Don't look down. Think of the poor kitty. I hauled myself a little higher, then higher still, and just a little higher until I was close enough to almost touch the cat. We looked into one another's eyes for a shared moment. Then, while I watched, its agile body leaped from branch to branch as easily as breathing until it hit the ground. From the ground beneath the tree, as though mocking me, the furry devil had the audacity to look up at me and meow. I tried to climb back down but it was quickly and embarrassingly evident that my limbs were frozen. I was petrified. I was going nowhere. Chapter 4. Mac She's stuck? Jay's voice held a note of amusement as he fielded the call on the emergency line. I perked up. I'd been living and working in Sunkiss Key for several months now, and save for a couple of kitchen fires and a few out-of-control bonfires on the beach, the job was dull as dishwater. Not that I wanted more fires, but something other than sitting at the station twiddling our thumbs would be nice. In a tree? If this is another prank by the police department. A couple of the other guys came over and listened in. A woman was stuck in the old oak in the center of town. Jay hung up, grinning wickedly. 
So, is it terrible if I make a joke about a pussy stuck in a tree? I rolled my eyes. Yes, it is terrible. Let's go. We piled into the one and only fire truck the island of Sunkiss Key owned and pulled up to the curb on Main Street next to the oak I lovingly referred to as Walter. It was the only tree on the island that looked anything like the trees in Ohio where I grew up. The knotted, twisted growth sprouting from the earth seemed to resemble Walter Kowalski, the old man who used to live next door to us when I was a kid. As I removed the ladder from the side of the truck, Jay and Mateo assumed the task of explaining our plan of action and offering reassurances to the woman in the tree. The closer I got to where they stood, the harder the blood pounded through my veins straight to my cock. What the fuck? I groaned aloud and inhaled deeper. As a sweet, heavenly scent washed over me, my cock rose to full mast, attempting to point the way like a directional arrow. Um, hello, ma'am. My name is Jay Cutter. I'm with the Sunkiss Key Fire Department, and we're here to get you down. Jay was clearly trying to portray a professional demeanor. His words were professional enough, but I could detect the amusement in his tone. I didn't like it. What I liked even less, what I hated, in fact, was that his voice was also flirtatious. No idea why that made my blood boil, but it did. I elbowed through the guys, nudged Jay harder than necessary, and locked the ladder at the base of the tree. When my gaze rose to locate our victim, my breathing stopped, my scalp tingled, my vision tunneled, and my brain struggled to process what I was seeing. I was staring at the almost fully exposed ass of a woman in a sundress and combat boots and an exceedingly nice ass it was. She cleared her throat. If you gentlemen would just move back a tiny bit, I'd love to hurl myself to my death right about now. Her sultry voice washed over me, and my fully alert cock leaped achingly in my pants. My wolf danced circles beneath my skin. The fucker was clawing to get out and cozy up to this sultry-voiced woman with the perfectly rounded ass cheeks. I was daydreaming about slipping my tongue beneath the little swath of pink cotton that barely concealed the most delicious aroma on the planet. Mate. My hand rested on the bark bracing me. Mate? Now? Of all the fucking luck, I just found my mate up in a tree in the middle of Main Street. I took another deep inhale, and she was 100% human. Earth to Mac. Jay came up behind me, slapping my shoulder. I know, it's a hell of a sight there, but you want to snap out of it and give us a hand? I mean, uh, we are professionals, after all. It hit me that I wasn't the only one with a view up my mate's dress at her exceedingly nice ass. The thin strip of panties hid little, and as the breeze fluttered her skirt around her thighs, we were all given an eyeful. A jolt of fury ripped through me like a thunderclap. I was suddenly fuming, red hot. Steam was probably shooting from my ears. Turn the fuck away! All you fucking perverts, turn around! I snarled out the order with every ounce of power and dominance I had in my shifter body and followed it with an I mean business growl. Jay, Finn, and Mateo responded instantly, which helped restore a modicum of calm to my wolf. Unfortunately, her scent still swirled around me. It floated in the air, wafted over me, wound its way into my nostrils, and turned me into a lust addled, hormone flooded, instant driven animal. The other guys had turned away, sure, but that wasn't enough. All of us, except Mateo, were shifters, and they could fucking smell her, too. I began shoving them. Back up! Back the fuck up! Jay caught on right away, and Finn soon after. Laughing, he dragged a confused Mateo across the street with him. Dude, you better listen. Max, really not kidding. He's about to fight to the death anyone who even looks at that woman cross-eyed. 
If you want to make it home to your wife and kids tonight, I suggest you lower your eyes and keep your distance. Jay made a big production of holding his hands up and turning around with his back to me. The other guys did the same amid a few snorts and snickers. I made sure the ladder was anchored before climbing up a few rungs. My heart slammed around in my chest cavity like a ping pong ball. I felt giddy, intoxicated. When I was level with her and able to take in her appearance clearly, everything around me stilled. As a shifter, I'd always known it was possible I would someday find a mate, and that if I did, I'd recognize her instantly as the one. Ever since I was a boy, I'd tried to imagine what my mate might look like. I could never decide if she'd be short or tall, thick or thin, dark-skinned or light-skinned, blonde, brunette, or redhead. I didn't really have a type, or so I thought. Looking at the woman in front of me, I now knew I most certainly did have a type. Tall, willowy, but not excessively thin, with hazel eyes and short, sandy blonde hair that fluttered around her face in the gentle breeze. That was my type. She was my type. When she shifted on the branch slightly and wobbled backwards, her eyes flew wide. Her lips parted in a sharp gasp. I quickly snapped my arm out, locking it around her waist, and pulled her closer, tucking her into my body. The side of her breast pressed softly against my chest. Her hip was a warm weight against my leg. My jaw clenched and my posture stiffened. The slightest adjustment of my position would press my aching erection against her hip bone. I was a big guy, even in shifter terms, so as tall as she was, she was rather slight against me. I fought to keep myself from swinging her around, hoisting her up, and plastering her against me with her legs wrapped around my waist. Her heart thumped wildly, but it was her little puffs of nervous breath against my neck that were nearly my undoing. I would have died right then and there just for a taste of her. To run my tongue over her smooth skin, trail it down between her thighs, over her silken folds. Breathe in, breathe out. Try not to think about tearing her clothes off and making love to her with your tongue as she writhes in ecstasy to the pinnacle of her sweet, delicious climax. She scanned my face, stopping when she met my eyes. The scent of her arousal spiked. Ah, so I was affecting her as well. One of her hands latched onto the front of my shirt, her fingernails bit into my skin. Those wide, hazel eyes stared straight into mine. They seemed to be searching for something. I swallowed down my hyped libido. I had to get my head together and get her down out of Walter before she fell and broke a bone or sprained a ligament or, God forbid, cracked her skull open. She was fragile. As a shifter, I could fall. I could fall all day long. I could crack my skull all over the place. Not a big deal. I'd heal. But my mate was fragile, as were all humans, easily broken and susceptible to a myriad of diseases. I'd spent enough time as a first responder to know that. That sobering thought cleared my head. I want you to step down onto the ladder with me, okay? She inhaled sharply and shook her head. I, I can't. It's not safe. I'm right here. I promise you I won't let anything happen to you. She shook her head again. If I start to fall, no, I'm too heavy. I'll take us both down. Hey, look at my arm. I flexed my bicep. Then grinning and speaking as soothingly as possible, I raised an eyebrow in my best macho he-man pose. These guns aren't just for show, you know. My lame attempt at humor seemed to work. She visibly relaxed some. I could toss you over my shoulder and carry you down, but I thought you'd be more comfortable using the ladder on your own. No, you can't carry me. When I made a move to prove her wrong, she squeaked and practically leaped onto the ladder with me. It was self-sabotage on my part. I should have carried her. Keeping my promise that I wouldn't allow her to fall, I stood behind her, which only served to press her ass against my pelvis and her back against my chest. 
My arms remained around her with my hands braced on the rungs of the ladder just above hers. Good job. She looked over her shoulder at me with a shaky smile. From so close, her scent was even more tantalizing, like a heady drug, potent, stirring, torturous. Okay, I'll climb down a rung, and then you climb down a rung. Got it? She nodded. You must think I'm ridiculous, but I hate heights. I have an irrational fear of them that I'd like to conquer. Someday, just not right this moment. She trembled against me, but descended step by step as I'd instructed. Why did you climb a tree then? With a sexy little frown, she huffed. There was a, well, what appeared to be a cute, helpless kitten. I now know all that cuteness was a ruse, a cunning ploy meant to lure me to the most embarrassing moment of my life. What I thought was an adorable little ball of fluff was really an evil demon spawn armed with a skill set of Machiavellian maneuvers. As soon as it coaxed me up here with its lies and trickery, the fiendish furball ditched me. <laughs> and then you were stuck. I took another step down. And then I was stuck, she groaned. But of course, not before I flashed all of Main Street. I winced as she followed me because with every step she took, her ass rubbed against my boner. I wondered if I should apologize for that, but it wasn't as though I could control it, not with her ass stroking it every few seconds. Sometimes the damn thing had a mind of its own. Chapter 5, Mel If there was one consolation prize in this nightmarish ordeal, it was being helped down the ladder by Hulk, the hunky firefighter. The man was delicious, and calling him Hulk was no exaggeration. My rescuer was so big, he made me feel petite. It wasn't often that I was around a man who made me feel petite, and, based on the part of his anatomy pressed against my left butt cheek, there was nothing small about him. Hulk was packing. Tall, firmly muscled, with cropped hair and dark blue eyes that matched his navy blue uniform. He had a patch over the left peck that bore a picture of a ladder and a crisscrossed axe surrounded by the words firefighter on one side, rescue on the other, and EMT at the bottom. As big sexy men in uniform went, this one was the biggest and sexiest I'd ever seen. My vajayjay sure did think so. That old girl perked right up and responded instantly to him. Even while focusing on my descent, with my arms trembling and my legs quivering, I achieved a total body blush each time I managed down a rung, and his hard bulge brushed my backside. It was like foreplay, agonizingly torturous foreplay. By the time we reached the ground, I was breathless. My rescuer's body heat vanished from behind me, but his hand remained on my back as he guided me off the ladder. Even his hand was an aphrodisiac. I groaned. A small crowd had gathered. Great. An audience to witness my mortification. Next time you see a cute but deceptively demonic kitten, just give us a call. We'll handle it. My smile was feeble. Got it, and thank you. I was so hot that I was sweating buckets. I happened to glance at the edge of the crowd, where the firemen were elbowing each other, snickering, and whispering while watching us. Could I have made a bigger fool of myself? I think not. A drop of boob sweat trickled down my cleavage. My head felt airy and light. I was a little dizzy. I recognized the symptoms and knew I needed to check my blood sugar. For a diabetic, a stressful situation could trigger a hypoglycemic episode. Slowly, I backed away. Well, um, thanks again. My feet managed to trip over themselves as if the whole tree incident wasn't humiliating enough. I righted myself, turned, and raced off. My pace was a brisk walk for half a block, and then 
horrified and desperate to be away from the scene of my humiliation, I all outran. I cut down the first side street, heading straight for the beach. My small crossbody bag held my flex pen and glucose monitor, which I retrieved as soon as I found a semi-secluded spot. My sugar level was too low due to exertion, so I popped a couple of glucose tablets before I called Ingrid on her work line. Moro Insurance, this is Ingrid speaking. How may I help you? Oh my God, Ingrid. I just had the most humiliating experience. She gasped. Tell me everything, but make it fast. Norman and Mommy Bates will be back from a meeting at any moment. My brain froze and I made a few stuttered sounds that weren't actually words. Adam, holy shit. I hadn't even thought about him when I was asked to pelvis with the firefighter. I'd forgotten I'd even had a boyfriend. Mel, what is it? Out with it. I swore. I forgot I had a boyfriend. She made a fart sound. About time. Keep up the good work. That's awful of me. I was stuck in a tree and this hot, and I do mean scorching, firefighter came to rescue me. He was, and he... I mean, I blew out a breath and shook my head, just remembering how it felt to be flush against the hard plains of the firefighter's hot bod and feel the bulge of the firefighter's hot rod. My cheeks heated again. The man was able to make me blush when I so much as thought about him. That was a first. And Ingrid, next to him I felt dainty. Stuck in a tree? You were stuck in a tree? Like a pussycat? I groaned. Don't joke. It was mortifying. I flashed my undies to the entire island fire department. She squealed. Sounds juicy. I have questions. First, why a tree? Second, what's his name? Third, when will you see him again? I gave her the cliff notes of the incident, but went easy on the sizzling attraction and my smutty carnal fantasies. I didn't get his name, and I hope I never see him again. Did you hear the part about the whole group of firefighters getting a peep show of my butt cheeks? Oh, I certainly did. I'm fanning myself. Girl, you lived out one of my wildest fantasies. Ingrid, I'm serious. That's on my bucket list, in writing. And why didn't you get his number? Just because he saw your ass? That's a terrible reason. Besides, that can be a plus. A plus. I fail to see. Look at it this way. The tense, fidgety part of getting naked with someone for the first time is practically over. You don't have to fret about what he'll think of your cellulite dimples or lack of a consistent workout routine. He's already seen your bum. Are you saying my ass is fat and flabby? What? No, she laughed. Of course not. But we're no spring chickens anymore, are we? Actually, I think that was a little transference I did just then. I keep wondering if Pierce is ignoring me because I'm no longer a toned 20-year-old. Neither is he. Besides, I'm not getting naked with the firefighter. I'm never seeing him again. Even if I do see him, it won't matter. I'm with Adam. You're with Adam like some people are with chlamydia. Get rid of it. There's a treatment for that. It's called a vacation fling with a sexy firefighter who makes you feel dainty. I shook my head. I don't cheat. Yay, brilliant, even better. Then end it with Adam. I'm ending this conversation. I started back toward the bed and breakfast. I just thought you'd enjoy the fact that I'd completely demeaned, demoralized, and degraded myself. Oh, I enjoyed it, thoroughly. Especially the part about the hulking fireman. She lowered her voice and swore. Bugger. Cruella and Carlos de Ville are back. I hate my life. Love you. Love you too. Do me a favor, though, shag a firefighter, so I can live vicariously through you. Please, I'm on my knees here. Before the line disconnected, I overheard Ingrid switch to the saccharine sweetness of her professional voice. Why, hello, Mrs. Morrow. I trust your meeting went well. 
I rolled my eyes. I wasn't breaking up with Adam, and I definitely wasn't sleeping with a firefighter. Not that a firefighter offered, which was good. That two-by-four in his pants was probably from adrenaline, the thrill of rescuing someone. Some men were like that, weren't they? Chapter 6, Mac Jenny, it is too much for them. You can't just dump your daughter off on them whenever you feel like it. I scowled and leveled her with my most sinister evil eye. Your father's much too ill right now, and your mother has enough on her plate. She doesn't need the added stress. You're a mother now yourself. You need to step up and take responsibility for raising your child. My spoiled niece glared at me. First of all, don't mom shame me. Second of all, I'm a grown-ass woman, and you are not my dad. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to get you to understand that the world doesn't revolve around you. Your mother is going through an unimaginably difficult time. I hope you never have to deal with anything like that yourself. But she's always been there for you when you needed help. It's your turn to be there for her. She needs your help now. My mother is fine. You're the only one getting in my face and making a big stink about it. Heather doesn't have the strength to argue with you, Jenny. She's too exhausted. If you can't see that, you're even more self-absorbed than I thought. Go to hell, Uncle Mac. Jenny dragged a pack of cigarettes from her purse, shook one out, and lit it, inhaling deeply. Things were easier before you came, you know. For you, yeah, I bet they were. You didn't have anyone holding you accountable. But now you do, so I suggest you step up and grow up. I am grown up. I have a kid. You birthed a child. It's not the same thing. She took another hit from her cigarette, breathed it in deeply, and blew it back out in a long stream of smoke. You're a real asshole, you know that? Am I? Okay, I'm an asshole. Fine, I'll be an asshole. But you're 19 years old with a child you don't take care of, and an ill father that you don't seem to give two shits about. You don't work, you don't go to school. All you do is follow dumbass boys around trying to get knocked up with another baby that you won't take care of. From the way things look, I'd say you're pretty much dead weight around here. Your father may be dying, and if that happens, your mother could very well lose her will to live too. The grief of it could kill her, but what's it to you? As long as they're still able to stand upright and breathe in and out, they can shoulder your responsibilities for you, isn't that right? Heather came rushing out of the house, a pained look on her lined and weary face. Hamish, no! Don't do this, please! Not like that, not right now! Jenny threw her cigarette down and stomped it onto the pavement. I'm fucking out of here. Swearing, I turned back to my niece, my sister's guilt trip already ripping a hole through my heart. Jenny, wait. I'm sorry, I- Fuck off! Her voice wavered and tears filled her eyes before she turned and took off down the street. Heather slapped the back of my head. What the hell, Hamish? I know her behavior is atrocious right now, but shouting at her like that isn't going to solve anything. Heather was ten when I was born, and she'd assumed the role of second mother to me. She was the only person who ever called me Hamish, my given first name. To everyone else, I'd been Mac since I was six years old. I growled. Someone needs to say something. She's a delinquent. Yes, well, she's having a difficult time, too. Like you pointed out, she may lose both her parents. I closed my eyes and rolled my head back, releasing a sigh. I didn't mean that, Heather. Neither of you is dying. Warren's a fighter, and he'll pull through. I was just trying to get through her thick skull. Give her some space, okay? I know she's not handling this in a very mature way, but she's still a kid herself. I've been trying to convince her to let me set her up with a therapy appointment. So far, she's balked at the idea, but I haven't given up, she sighed. If you get tired of caring for Amethyst, I'll never get tired of her. Don't worry about that. Am is a blessing. I'm very attached to that droodle bug, and you've got enough on your plate. I got her. I'd purchased the condo next door to my sister and brother-in-law, so I would be handy when Heather needed me to help with Warren. Lately, when I wasn't on shift at the station, I'd also been keeping Amethyst overnight, 
since Jenny was making at home fewer and fewer nights these days, and Heather and Warren needed all the sleep they could get. Being woken up by an infant in the middle of the night didn't bother me one bit. I'd been a firefighter for 11 years, since I was 22. I was used to having to hop out of bed, alert and ready, whenever duty required. We'll be fine, little brother. Stop worrying so much, she grinned. You need to have your own life too, you know, so you stress less about mine. My own life? My mind drifted, like it had for the 500th time in the last five hours, to a tall, willowy, hazel-eyed beauty. Who would be perfect, if she weren't human. Chapter 7. Mel Breakfast at Rise and Shine was a total body experience. The dining room served fresh cinnamon rolls that melted in your mouth. And bacon. I hadn't eaten bacon since 1997. My thighs might suffer later, but my belly was in heaven. I'd forgotten how orgasmic high-fat food could be. The freshly squeezed Florida orange juice was the topper. I could drink a pitcher of the stuff. And I would have if I didn't have to carefully monitor my glucose level. Since I'd arrived, I'd shot Adam a couple of short texts but avoided his calls. I'd spent the rest of the day yesterday, after my tree incident, lying on the beach, swimming in the ocean, and enjoying a delicious dinner at a place called Tuna's Seafood House. Then, with a glass of wine in hand, I watched the sunset while soaking in my private jacuzzi. Embarrassing tree incident aside, so far my vacation was turning out better than expected. No place was ever this enjoyable with Adam around. Jacob sat at my table and talked to me while I ate breakfast. He was a nice kid and pleasant company, and he shocked me when he called me Melody Maines. The kid had put two and two together. Frankly, I was impressed that a kid his age had ever heard of me. Or should I say that he'd ever heard the one song that was my claim to fame? Yes, I was a one-hit wonder. Not that I had any sour feelings about descending from a chart topper to an everyday nobody. It had been my choice to secede from the limelight. Jacob asked me to sing a couple of times, but I didn't want to interrupt anyone's breakfast. Before he had a chance to implement persuasive tactics, a small woman with purple hair, tattoos, facial piercings, and a baby on her hip strolled in and spotted Jacob. Jake, your mother told me you'd replaced me, but I didn't believe it. Where has the time gone? I remember when you were two feet tall, picking the wedgies out of your butt crack and eating your boogers. She sniffled and wiped an imaginary tear from her eye. Jacob grimaced. Don't embarrass me, Parker. Fine. She hip-bumped him out of his seat and sat in his place. Your mom wants you back up front. She said, break's over. The woman turned to me conspiratorially and sighed. He used to think I was the best thing since sliced bread. Now I'm an embarrassment. How quickly they outgrow their childhood crushes and move on. She tore off a piece of cinnamon roll and handed it to her baby on her knee before focusing her attention back on me. You're just the person I was looking for. I heard about you. Me? I wondered if she'd heard about my ass-bearing incident. I knew how fast news spread in small towns. I grew up in one just outside Syracuse. Well, I should say, I grew up in one until I hit my teens and became a slave to the recording studio for a decade or so. You're Melody, right? Melody Maines, the one who's singing at Arden and Flynn's wedding? I nodded. Guilty, only Melody Maines was my stage name. That was another lifetime ago. It's actually Cameron, Melody Cameron. Don't listen to anything she says about me, Mel. Jacob cast one last worried look at Parker before leaving. He thinks I'm going to tell you that he's crushing on you, but I'm not because I'm sure you already know. I laughed. The boy wears his heart in his eyes. I nodded. Agreed. He's a nice kid. He's going to make some girl very, very happy one day. She looked after him and tapped her chin. 
might have someone in mind, actually. I wasn't sure if she was joking or not until she leaned forward. Call me crazy, but I have the perfect man for you, too. I blinked. Okay, crazy. She tossed her head back and laughed. I asked for that. Literally. Let me introduce myself. I'm Parker Pettit. I'm the island matchmaker with a tremendous success rate, and I really do have the perfect man for you. His name is... I have a boyfriend. I did not deem it necessary to add that rather than enjoying a vacation with my boyfriend, I was enjoying a vacation from him. Oh, is it serious? When I hesitated, she grinned. I knew it. No need to explain. We all make mistakes. Well, I'll let you terminate Mr. Wrong. Meanwhile, let me tell you about Mr. Oh, so right. I stared at her. Who? Your dream guy. The one I intend to match you with. Free of charge, I might add. All I ask in return is a testimonial for my website. And it would help if you used your stage name. Celebrity endorsement, you understand? Anywho, he's beautiful. He's also kind, selfless, and a man's man, if you know what I mean. She winked. Plus, he has a great sense of humor. How often do you find a total package like that? If you were me, never. Her promises sounded way too good to be true. And I knew better than to take a gamble I could lose. Best to stick with a sure thing. I'll pass, but thanks anyway. Her eyes narrowed. Mm, we'll see. Either way, I'm excited I got the chance to meet you. I sat flabbergasted as she started singing Alive in Your Eyes, my one and only chart-topping hit single, way too loudly. The beat of your heart, the words on your lips, your love for me always alive in your eyes. I looked around the dining room, hoping no one recognized me. Oh, I love that song. We're so lucky to have you on the island and singing at the wedding. Fortunately, from what I could glean from the sly glances I shot anxiously around the room, Parker was the one attracting all the attention. No one even seemed to recognize me. Well, actually, it's my band that will be performing. I haven't done a solo gig in years, and I haven't performed that particular song in even longer. God, I'm not kidding about this guy being perfect for you. I have a sixth sense about these things. Too bad you have to clear up the whole boyfriend mess first. I laughed. As a 41-year-old woman, I am glad I have a boyfriend. She could continue to delude herself with the assumption that I was clearing up or terminating something. Well, I have to ski-daddle, but I'm so glad I ran into you. By the way, we're having a party at Mimi's Cabana tonight. You know the place? I was hoping you'd join us. She grinned. I mean, if you haven't had enough excitement climbing trees. I groaned. You heard. Of course you did. The whole town must know by now. Not at all. I just happened to run into... Well, it doesn't matter. I'll pick you up at Rise and Shine tonight at seven. Before I could refuse, she was gone, and I was left sitting at the breakfast table, mouth agape, in awe of her persuasive skills. Hostage negotiators could learn a thing or two from the woman. Chapter 8. Mac Why are you smiling? I was just getting home from work, and my first stop was Heather and Warren's to pick up Am. But there was something about Heather's smile that had my hackles up. I didn't trust that grin. Not at all. Parker Pettit called. She invited you to a party at Mimi's tonight. My sister saw I was about to protest and held up a hand. I already told her you were coming, so I suggest you go and get changed. Maybe take a shower? You smell like dog. I'm not leaving you alone with Am. You've already had her all day. Warren cleared his throat from the doorway. 
Am was seated on his lap and tucked into the crook of one arm while he rolled his chair with the other. What the hell do you think I am, smelly dog? Wallpaper? I threw my hands up dramatically. Go ahead, insult me, both of you. Warren had good days and bad days. As I discreetly surveyed him, I determined today was one of his better days. Fine, I think I will go out. Leave you all to think about what an asset I am to have around. Did he say he was an ass all around? Warren chuckled. First thing he said today that made any sense. I grinned and kissed Heather on the forehead before hurrying over and pecking Am on the cheek. You're a couple of ungrateful relatives, you know that? I left them there, both smiling, and headed next door to my place. I felt guilty for leaving them with the baby for any longer than was necessary, but it would be worse if I stayed home. I could sense that if Heather and Warren watched me leave for a night out, it would convince them far more than my words could, that they weren't a burden on me, and neither was Am, that I could be here for my family when they needed me, and still have a life of my own. Or pretend to when they were watching. I didn't want to go anywhere, but they needed me to. I took a shower and changed into clean clothes before taking my time, walking across Main Street to Mimi's cabana. I had no intention of staying long. I'd just make an appearance and have a drink or two so I could be home in time to give Am a bath and put her to bed. I didn't want to risk waking her up when I carried her home to my place for the night. Mimi was a wild card, and her place was always a good time. The woman kept everyone on their toes with her coconut bra and sailor's vocabulary. I made sure to wave and blow her a kiss before scanning the place looking for the party. Instead of a party, I found Parker and Maxim sitting side by side in a booth, talking to whoever was across the table from them. I couldn't tell from where I stood. One step closer, though, just one step, and I knew. It was her, my mate. Bells were going off like a five alarm back at the station. I wanted to turn and run. I told Parker repeatedly that I had way too much on my plate. The last thing I needed or wanted was a mate. After finding out my mate was human, that statement held tenfold. Damn, that woman was a meddler. How the hell had I fallen for this again? Parker had tricked me into a blind date once before. It could have been a total disaster, too, if the woman, Ellen, hadn't also been conned into a date she wanted no part of. We ended up having an enjoyable dinner together and leaving as friends. Okay, I had to give Parker credit. She did hit the nail on the head this time. Despite being 100% human, the woman she chose was 100% my mate. I didn't even know her name. After getting her down from Walter, she hadn't stuck around long enough for me to ask. I'd say that was a telltale sign she wanted little to do with me either. How the hell had Parker found her and gotten her to the bar? I hadn't been able to stop thinking about my mate since I watched her race down Main Street in the opposite direction. Not that it was a good excuse, but that was a major reason I'd been on edge and had been so quick to lash out at Jenny. I should turn around and leave, just go. But my wolf was going crazy trying to get at her, and I was strung so tightly I felt I might snap in two. Maybe a quick glimpse of her? As I stepped closer, my mate's head snapped around. When she spotted me, her eyes grew wide. That's when I knew. She was an innocent victim here, too. She'd had no idea this was a setup. Her jaw fell, and her tongue darted out to nervously lick her lips. Mac, so glad you could make it. I understand you and Mel are acquainted. Parker's devious grin said it all. Maxim just shook his head and took a drink of his beer. Mel, so that was her name. I stood staring at the empty spot next to her like poisonous spikes might sprout out of the pleather and lodge themselves in the ass of an unsuspecting patron who happened to sit there. We ran into each other. Mel looked past me, at the door. She was going to bolt. The look in her eyes said it all. My wolf didn't want her going anywhere, the masochist. Before my rational brain could talk my crazed libido out of it, 
I sank into the booth next to her, impaling myself with the spikes of destiny. When our thighs touched, my jaw locked and my fists bawled. Well, the party ended up being a lot smaller than I expected, Parker shrugged. The woman had no shame. When Maxim snorted, Parker shot him a warning scowl. Then she turned to us and, sweet as sugar, moved on. I ran into Mel at Rise and Shine this morning. She's singing at the wedding tomorrow night, Flynn and Arden's. I couldn't help turning my head to look at her. She was a singer? With a sultry speaking voice like hers, it was likely she had an amazing singing voice. Fuck, her scent was messing with my head. Everyone was looking at me. Why? Was I supposed to say something? Uh, that's nice. Maxim snorted into his beer and, when attention turned to him, tried to hide a knowing grin. Chapter 9 Mel My entire body overheated the moment my firefighter appeared. No, not my firefighter, a firefighter. He didn't belong to me. He was his own firefighter, not mine. Mac. His name was Mac. Tonight, he wasn't in uniform. He wore a white t-shirt that clung to his wide shoulders and sculpted pecs like a second skin, medium washed jeans and scuffed work boots. His hair was still damp from the shower. He looked masculine and sexy and powerful all at once. I wanted to blame the Florida temperatures for the heat wave that rolled through me, but I'd been just fine, cool as a cucumber, until Max sat down and his thigh brushed mine. Then, hello, thermometer. Mercury shot through the roof. His thigh was all I could focus on. It was so distracting. That and his smell. Why did he smell so good? Like a bonfire on the beach at night wrapped in a blanket under the stars. Didn't make sense the things this man did to my body. Could what I was feeling be gratitude? I mean, what woman wasn't turned on by her own knight in shining armor? No, that wasn't it. Mac helped me and all, but it wasn't as though he'd saved my life or risked his own in the process. I would have gotten down, eventually. I needed to remember one thing, though, and cool my jet skis. Just because I was enjoying some solo vacation time did not mean I was single. I had a boyfriend, Aaron. I mean, Adam. I was committed to Adam, and if there was one thing I despised, it was people who didn't honor their commitments. One's word was one's bond. I'd always believed that. I was not in the market for a new man, despite Parker and her devious machinations but sitting next to Mac was slow torture. He seemed to be as shocked to see me as I was to see him, which meant Parker had pulled the same setup on him. He probably didn't even want to be here. Mac is actually from Ohio, Mel. He only recently moved here. Parker blinked innocently and smiled. And Mac, Mel here was a big recording artist 20 or so years ago. You've probably heard of her, Melody Maines. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. When my thigh rubbed against Max again, fire shot straight to my core, and I had to bite my lip to keep a moan from escaping. This was wrong, no matter how right it felt. My stomach twisted itself in a knot. I looped the strap of my purse over my shoulder and spoke to Mac without making eye contact. Could you uh, let me out, please? I I'm not feeling well. Oh no, what's wrong? Parker's frown was genuine. Mac moved immediately, allowing me to slide out of the booth and stand on somewhat shaky legs. When he took a step back and his eyes passed over me, he wore an odd expression, something I didn't recognize. I'm sorry, I have to go. And that was how I ran from Mac, the hulky firefighter, for the second time in 24 hours. I probably should have been embarrassed, and maybe later I would be, but at that moment I was just relieved to get away. There was something about Mac that made me want to cross all kinds of boundaries and compromise my morals in all sorts of ways.
I quickly made my way down Main Street, crossed over to the west side of the island, and strolled back along the beach. My nerves were jangled. I felt too raw and exposed to want to return to my room and stare at the walls just yet. When my phone buzzed, I prayed it wasn't Adam. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him right then, not with my thoughts going haywire. The screen said Ben, which meant it was either my brother Pierce or my cousin Ben. They were an overprotective couple of idiots, and since the two of them were always together, they often used each other's phones. Is this thing one or thing two? Rude. If I didn't love you so much, I might not like you. It was Ben. Good comeback, Ben grunted. You want my comeback? You'll have to scrape it off your mama's teeth. Ew, gross, that's your aunt, you freak, I grinned. I'm scarred for life now from that mental image. I found a shady spot under a couple of palm trees and plopped down in the sand. Let me see. Before you ask, yes, I've been locking my door. No, there's no one I find creepy. No, I don't feel in danger. Yes, the town seems safe. Yes, I'm eating and practicing self-care. No, I haven't had unprotected sex and gotten knocked up by a total stranger. I didn't mention that there seemed to be a perfect candidate on the island. Well, thank you for easing my mind, but that wasn't why I called. Grinning, I hugged my knees and stared out at the ocean. What do you want, then? Just checking in. Ben? Fine. We heard that you and Adam are having troubles. Oh, why don't you two mind your own damn business? The fact that Ben and Pierce were acquaintances of Adam's and thought he walked on water was another thing tying me to the man. He was the first guy they welcomed. Probably because they hadn't yet seen through his big bank account and phony baloney charm. They were way too protective of a fully capable adult woman, but due to my past, I had difficulty convincing them I wasn't as naive as they seemed to think I was. When I'd shot to fame as a recording artist almost overnight, I very quickly found myself isolated and protected from the outside world by my family. If I did go anywhere, I had bodyguards. I hated every second of it. As my contract went up for renewal, neither the record company nor my agent was at all pleased when I decided that the limelight wasn't for me, and I bowed out. Pierce and Ben, however, stood beside me, and for that I'd always be grateful. I had found it stressful living the life of a celebrity, and had longed for a normal life. Fixing dinners for my husband, reading bedtime stories to our children, PTA meetings and family vacations. I got rid of the celebrity status, but at over 40, I hadn't achieved that life I'd envisioned. I've got to go. Fine, but I also wanted to remind you to pick us up in the morning. Our flight gets in at 11. Whatever. I'll think about it. I hung up. Ben's call helped distract me a little but thoughts about Mac were still running rampant in my brain. Inhaling deeply, I filled my lungs with salty ocean air. Ugh, even the scent of the sea reminded me of Mac. He is a stranger. This obsession with him was ridiculous, and it wasn't right. I should be thinking about Adam, not Mac. I was supposed to feel this way about... I groaned aloud. Of course. It was probably my dissatisfaction with Adam and our relationship that had me manufacturing this extreme attraction to a man I barely knew. Sure, Mac was hot and all, but simply put, Mac was the grass on the other side of the fence. He looked greener, but eventually he'd need fertilizer too. The sound of water splashing nearby caused my head to swing in its direction, just in time to witness a polar bear break the surface and lumber out of the ocean onto the sand. <laughs> nice. Wait, what? Heart jackhammering in my chest, I slid farther under the cover of shade. My breath caught in my throat. I would have screamed, but I was too afraid. I was going to be eaten by a polar bear. Wait. Why was there a polar bear in the tropics? I thought back to the only beverage I'd consumed at Mimi's cabana, a Diet Coke, 
Had it been spiked with something? Some sort of hallucinogen? It hadn't tasted funny. The blood rushed to my head. I was going to pass out. My stomach did a flip. I was going to throw up. Then, before I could either pass out or throw up, the polar bear vanished. Just vanished. And right where he'd been standing was a naked man. Blink, blink, blink. The man stretched, yawned, scratched under his ball sack, then jogged off down the beach. Blink, blink, blink. What did I just see? My brain felt like an old Commodore 64 with dial-up internet. I was not computing. Polar bears didn't live in Florida. A polar bear should not be emerging from the Gulf of Mexico. But that wasn't at all weird compared to seeing a polar bear turn into a man. I rubbed my forehead. Polar bears do not turn into men, Mel. That could not have really happened. I felt dizzy, confused. Dizzy with confusion? Was I hyperglycemic? Hallucinations could be a symptom of dangerously high blood sugar. I rifled around in my purse for my monitor and checked my sugar. 90 mgdl, normal. Struggling to my feet, I stumbled toward the bed and breakfast, still rubbing my forehead. I knew what I saw. I had very definitely seen a large polar bear. Then I had very definitely seen that large polar bear turn into a nude man. I let myself into my room, locked the door, and leaned back, resting against it. Barring hyperglycemia or being slipped a mickey, what else could have caused me to hallucinate such an unusual sight? A stroke? I was only in my early forties, and while, as Ingrid pointed out, I didn't exercise consistently, I wasn't in terrible physical shape either. A tumor? That was a possibility. I'd had a yearly checkup not too long ago, but still. It took me a while to move from that spot. But when I did, I went into the bathroom and stared at myself in the mirror. I splashed cold water on my face. I would just go to sleep, and when I woke up, maybe I'd have answers. Only when my head hit my pillow, my brain would not allow sleep. No, it wanted to think about the polar bear. Then my brain started skipping from the polar bear to Mac. Then, not only was my brain awake, my body was right there with it. Sun Kiss Key was a strange place. I rolled over and fluffed my pillow silently, begging my brain to turn off. No go. It was laser focused on Mac. Mac with the strong thighs and delicious scent. Mac, with the large, capable hands and steel beams for arms that could easily rescue a damsel in distress like, oh, say, one stuck in a tree. Mac, with the very evident, very prominent, and very large bulge in his pants when he escorted said damsel down the ladder and said damsel's butt cheek happened to graze the front of his uniform. Rolling over again, I groaned. I had to get some sleep tonight. I had a big day tomorrow and needed to be well rested. It didn't happen. No matter how much I wanted my body to relax, sleep continued to evade me. I tossed and turned and stared at the ceiling. I tossed and turned and stared at the wall. I tossed and turned until I began to imagine that the polar bear didn't transform into a random man at all, but into Mac. Then I imagined instead of jogging off down the beach, Mac spotted me watching in the shadows and came closer, dropping to his knees, pulling me into his arms. Chapter 10. Mel I hadn't gotten a lick of sleep. I was exhausted and cranky. Instead of sitting in the dining room surrounded by people, I piled a plate high with bacon, added a cinnamon roll, and snuck back to my room. Jacob had kindly gotten me a thermal craft of coffee from the kitchen to take upstairs. I had an hour before I needed to pick up Ingrid and the guys. 
I nibbled on the bacon and cinnamon roll as I guzzled the coffee like it was the last pot I'd ever see. The drive to the airport was uneventful, except, of course, for the bathroom breaks every 20 minutes. By the time I arrived, the little group of people I loved most in the world was standing at the curb waiting for me. Even though I'd just seen them all a few days prior, I was so happy to see them. I parked at the curb and jumped out to hug each of them. Ingrid held me the tightest and then kept a grip on my arms as she pushed back and stared at me. You've a tan already, and you look positively glowing. What is going on here? Pierce grunted. You should be wearing sunscreen. I was, Mom. He ruffled my hair and started loading their things in the trunk. You do look good, sis. I don't know how that's possible. Barely slept a wink last night. My eyes feel like they're filled with sand. You've been partying too hard. Ben put his fingers just under my eyes and pulled down, making me jerk back and blink to get rid of the weird sensation. I slapped his hand and rolled my eyes. Hardly. I let Pierce drive and Ingrid and I sat in the back. When Pierce gave us a glance in the rearview mirror, Ingrid wiggled her hips closer to me and squeezed my arm. Her eyes were on the back of Pierce's head. She'd been head over heels for my brother since the day we met. That was in second grade, so that was saying something. Once on the road, she lowered her voice so the guys wouldn't overhear. I want to hear all about your firefighter. As soon as we got to the island, Ingrid and the guys checked in at the Bogart and Bacall Inn on Toucan Boulevard. Then Ingrid and I went to a local salon to get our hair and makeup done for the wedding. It was a splurge that we didn't usually make, but we were on vacation. The salon, Jammies, was packed. As we waited for our appointment times, Ingrid told me all about the last few days at work and how cranky Adam had been. She also demanded even more details about Mac. I gave her a few. I fought to keep from telling her about the polar bear I'd seen. That would have to wait until we were in private. The minute Parker walked in, I went silent. I forced a smile when she waved and came our way. I was still annoyed that she'd set me up like that, but I was polite. Ingrid, this is Parker Pettit, island matchmaker extraordinaire, beware. Parker, this is my best friend, Ingrid. Parker and Ingrid greeted each other before Parker sat beside me. I'm sorry. You're probably angry with me and I deserve it. I do, however, think I'm right about you and Mac. There's so much chemistry there, I wanted to douse myself in an ice bath, just watching the heat you two put off. Ingrid choked on her saliva and instantly butted in. Do tell, please. Everything, and I mean everything. I want to know all about this heated chemistry. I held up both hands and put an end to it before it even got started. No, we are not talking about this. I'm with someone else. There is no chemistry. That served to change the subject for the time being, but didn't stop the two of them entirely. I saw Ingrid and Parker sneak off to a back room while I was getting my hair curled. I had no doubt those two were gossiping like a couple of old hens. The Richardson Bennett wedding was being held at a local floral garden rather than a church, and it was a big to-do. The reception would take place right after at the same venue, and there were beluga caviar canapes, jumbo shrimp cocktail, foie gras on crostini, champagne fountains, and lots and lots of flowers. We arrived, set up, and checked our sound system before the guests started appearing. Then there was nothing to do until the reception but watch the ceremony. As I watched the happy couple exchange their vows, a lump formed in my throat, and I dabbed away tears that leaked from the corners of my eyes. Ingrid wrapped her arm around me and sighed. It'll be our turn one day. Involuntarily, a vision of Mac popped into my head and I rubbed my forehead, begging my brain to release that thought. Can you envision yourself walking down the aisle to meet Adam? The thought brought an unexpected wave of nausea, and I turned away to focus on smoothing my dress. My hands brushed over the red silk, and I blew out a slow breath. My chest felt tight. 
I don't want to talk about it. Didn't think so. I shot her a warning side glance that said I wasn't in the mood. Except, maybe I did need to talk some things out. Adam, Mac, the polar bear. There was a lot on my mind. But I shouldn't. I had a boyfriend. That was that. I love you. I just want you to be happy. She hugged me and then walked back to her drum set, tapping away at it quietly as she ran through the playlist in her head. Our gig at the reception went well. I introduced the newlyweds and the crowd seemed to enjoy our performance. The newlywed couple was one of the happiest I'd ever seen. I sang through their first dance and the father-daughter dance. And we played for almost three hours straight until Mr. and Mrs. Flynn Bennett danced the last dance and the party broke up. Much to Ingrid's dismay, Pierce was ready to hit Sunkiss Key like a college boy on spring break. A group of guests at the reception invited us all to meet up with them at Mimi's. Pierce gave an immediate yes, which was followed by a yes from Ingrid and a polite decline from me. I hadn't had much sleep, and I knew better than to burn the candle at both ends, especially with my diabetes. Apparently, Ben had already met a woman earlier when Ingrid and I were at the salon that he was interested in. He had her number, and she invited him to stop by her workplace. He was hoping to invite her to tag along with them to Mimi's. He begged me to accompany him to assure the woman that he was a nice, safe guy to hang out with. Since I was a dutiful cousin, I agreed. But like a complete moron, I didn't think to ask where the woman worked. Big mistake. That was how I ended up outside the one-story, red-painted, cinder-blocked building with black stenciled lettering, Sun-Kissed Key Fire Department. I was about to turn tail and run, but Ben had a hold of me and was tugging me forward. Come on. The front bay of the building was open and the fire truck was visible. There, buffing and polishing the wax on the body of the truck, as he stared right at me, was Mac. Damn it. Mac's eyes narrowed. His gaze raked down my body. My knees turned to jello, and I instantly felt twenty degrees hotter. Then Mac looked at Ben and frowned. Ben smiled and nodded. Hello? I'm looking for Haley. She's expecting me. Mac motioned with his head. She's inside, through the door on the left. Then his narrowed gaze again landed on me. Ben grinned at me. Be right back. Ben, I... He disappeared inside, leaving me standing in front of Mac all by myself. Bastard. I smiled tightly and crossed my arms over my chest. I was going to kill Ben. Mac flipped the rag in his hand over his shoulder and leaned against the front of the fire truck. I take it you sang at the wedding. Are you feeling better today? I uncrossed my arms and then crossed them again. The honest answer was my feet were killing me, I was tired, and standing anywhere near Mac was nerve-wracking. I'm fine. The couple, Flynn and Arden, seem happy together. Like he noticed my discomfort, he stepped away for a second and returned with a chair. He slid it in front of me and nodded at it. Please, sit. My feet didn't care that accepting the seat put me a few feet closer to him, but other parts of my body did. I rounded it and sat down, instantly sighing in relief. Thank you. Mac leaned against the truck again. I felt uncomfortable, as though he was studying me. Who's the guy? I shivered as his deep voice stroked over me. Ben's my cousin. A grunt was his only reply. Feeling anxious and out of place, I continued tripping over my tongue. Mm, my boyfriend couldn't make it. Adam. Morrow, Adam Morrow, uh, he's my boyfriend, that's his name. Ugh, oh, shut up, Melody. Mac's eyes hardened and he straightened. Silently, he moved closer, his mouth pressed into a thin line. Just when I thought he was going to say something, one of the other firefighters walked in. Well, look who climbed out of her tree and got all dolled up. I prayed for the ground to open and swallow me. It didn't, so I buried my face in my hands and groaned.
Chapter 11, Mac. I ignored Jay. I didn't even know what he said. My eyes were on Mel. Melody. Melody Maines. I'd been listening to her on iTunes since the night before when Parker revealed who she was. I remembered her. She was around the same age as my sister, and she'd been at the peak of her career with a chart-topping hit when I was in grade school. My sister and her friends used to put on a Melody Main CD and dance around her bedroom singing into hairbrush microphones. I only really remembered that one song, Alive in Your Eyes, then Melody Main's kind of just faded away. I had no idea why. I'd looked her up on Wikipedia, but there wasn't much there. Her fade to obscurity became even more baffling after I had a listen to the other songs on her two albums. She was good very good. Her smoky, sultry voice had a versatile sound that would lend itself beautifully to anything, from jazz to bluegrass to heavy metal to pop. And Mel herself was gorgeous. Why, with a talent like hers, had her career ended so early? I wanted to ask her about it, but my tongue was tied by that one word she'd said. Boyfriend. She had a boyfriend? How was that possible? She was mine. My wolf howled in fury, and my brain was besieged with demanding thoughts about tracking this boyfriend down and ripping him to confetti bits. Mel's face was buried in her hands. I silently willed her to lift her head and look at me. I hoped to see something, anything, that said she wanted me. It didn't matter that up until this moment I'd been telling myself that I didn't want to take a mate, especially not a human mate. Still, pride, ego, something, wanted her to at least crave me the way I craved her. Please don't let her really be into some other dude. When she looked up, her eyes met mine, but looked away quickly. She cleared her throat and smiled at Jay. What would it cost me to buy your silence? How much for your promise never to mention the tree incident again, especially not in front of my cousin or my brother? Jay pulled up a chair and sat beside her, ignoring my low, steady warning growl, just beneath human hearing range. He knew that he was pushing his luck. But he seemed to enjoy fucking with me. You sang at the Bennett wedding, right? Her smile was thin as she nodded. I did, with the cousin and brother I mentioned, and my best friend, Ingrid. There's a friend, Ingrid? Jay leaned closer and my growl became a little louder. Is this friend, Ingrid, a single and available friend, Ingrid? She is. She'll be at Mimi's tonight, if you're curious. Is she as beautiful as you? That was it. A growl tore out of me. I kicked the front of Jay's chair, hard. It upended, sending him flying backward. The bear shifter landed with a thud and lay sprawled on the ground, chuckling. Mel looked up at me with wide eyes. Did you just growl? I grunted, coughed, and tried to cover by offering Jay a hand to help him up. He refused and stood on his own, but I pushed him away and sat in the chair he'd fallen out of, which put me close to Mel. I crossed my arms over my chest. Yes. Her eyes studied me, and I could practically hear the gears in her brain working. I took the time to look her over again. In the long red dress she wore, her curves were mouth-wateringly enticing. She looked elegant and graceful and feminine. In her heels, she was tall, over six feet, but even with her heels, I was taller. So that guy in there hitting up McClintock is your brother or cousin? Jay laughed and shook his head. Good luck, bro. <laughs> She's a ball buster. Ben's my cousin, Mel shrugged. He deserves whatever he gets. I just hope if she busts his balls, I'm around to see it. Ouch. What did the poor guy do to deserve that? I shot Jay a go-the-fuck-away scowl. I wanted time to talk to my mate, no matter what the outcome would be. I wanted to at least know this engaging woman fate had paired me with, even if she was human. Ben and my brother, Pierce, have been making my life hell since I grew boobs. 
As far as I'm concerned, whatever payback comes their way comes in the name of karma. I growled again when Jay's eyes glanced my way. If the fucker made one comment about her boobs, he was a dead man. Sensing his impending doom, he just grinned and shook his head. Men never learn. Wilson and Cole joined us, both sported shit-eating grins the moment they spotted me sitting next to Mel. They didn't know for sure that we were mates, since I'd forbidden any mention of her at the station, but I imagined they'd guessed as much. If they hadn't put two and two together when we were rescuing her from Walter, they certainly did now, considering I couldn't stop glowering at anyone who looked at her. Wilson pulled out a chair and plopped his ass down. The infamous Mel. Her cheeks darkened as she smiled wryly at him. It never happened. Don't worry. Your singing reputation has outgrown your tree-climbing rep, Melody Maines. He stuck his hand out to shake hers, ignoring my angry snarl. I'm Mandy Wilson, and for the record, I remember every word of Alive in Your Eyes. It's so nice to meet you. Hey, me too. In fact, when my wife found out I met you, she was angry I didn't ask for your autograph. Mateo held up a memo pad and pen. Would you mind? He smiled sheepishly. Mel shook Wilson's hand and then asked Mateo for his wife's name before scribbling out a personalized message and signing it. Nice to meet all of you. I have a boyfriend, but I'm pretty sure being the center of attention of a room full of firefighters is my best friend's dream. She's going to be upset when she finds out she missed this. The guys grinned at me when they heard boyfriend, thinking Mel was talking about me. I didn't bother to correct them. Where is this best friend? Wilson wagged his eyebrows, making Mel laugh. Hey, I got dibs. Jay elbowed Wilson aside. Says who? It's bro code. I heard about her first. I get first shot. Wilson rolled his eyes. I call second then. When he strikes out, I'm up to bat. She went back to her hotel room to change. A group of them are meeting up at Mimi's cabana. Ben came to invite Haley and dragged me along with him. I don't know why. I guess he thought having his female cousin with him would make him look safer and less creepy. A mischievous look crossed her face, and she glanced into the station. I liked having her around, but I couldn't help but wish she'd come here to see me. I was slowly going insane, watching her smile at the other guys and kid around with them. I wanted to be alone with her, but it wasn't a good idea. I wasn't going to allow myself to bond with a human mate. If I found myself in Heather's shoes one day... I wasn't sure I'd have the strength to go on like she did. When a few more of the guys came over and everyone piled around Mel, I inched closer to her, unable to help myself. My wolf was snarling out warnings to all the unmated males around us. He wanted them all to leave and get the hell away from his mate. He wasn't torn. He knew exactly what he wanted. Mel. Desperately. When the station phone rang, the guys shifted focus for a moment, and I leaned closer to Mel. I think you've stolen the show. She winced slightly, and her head turned to look at me. Her scent caressed me. I could leave. I found myself smiling and shook my head. I think they'd be right behind, like rats following the Pied Piper. The corners of her lips lifted in a smile. They must not see a lot of women around here. Poor Haley. I shoved my hands in my pockets to keep from reaching for her. <laughs> they see plenty. Her smile drooped and her expression, which had been warm and friendly a second ago, morphed into something sour. I see. She adjusted her position and leaned in closer. I'm sorry about last night. I want you to know I wasn't a part of that. Parker knows I have a boyfriend, but she lured me there under false pretenses. I was under the impression there was a party. I grunted. She told me the same. She's a meddler. A word of warning. Parker may have recruited my friend Ingrid to be a willing pawn in her matchmaking schemes. Ingrid knows about your boyfriend, though. Her shimmery, peach-toned bottom lip was squeezed between her teeth, 
as she focused on nothing in particular over my shoulder. She's not a fan, I bristled. I wasn't either, but that was strictly on principle. I didn't know the guy. If her best friend didn't like him, that waved all kinds of red flags. Is he nice to you? She shrugged, then nodded, then shrugged. What the hell kind of answer is that? When she met my gaze again, her brow was furrowed. I should probably go back to my room and get some rest. Looks like Ben won't be needing me to vouch for him after all. He seems to be doing just fine. My heart sank. She'd only just arrived. I'd hardly gotten to know anything about her. I had all kinds of questions. Chapter 12 Mel My heart hammered in my chest. I was playing with fire just sitting there with Mac. I had to get away from him. I sure as hell didn't want to, though. I wanted to lean in closer, find out all about him, spend the rest of the night talking to him, or whatever progressed. I knew better, and instead I stood to leave. Hey, Mel, hold up. Haley wants to hear you sing. Ben came rushing out of the station, a shit-eating grin on his face. Just one song, cuz? Do me solid. I glared at him. You sing. Jay turned my way, wearing a cajoling grin. Wait a minute. We all want to hear you sing, don't we, guys? I heard Mac behind me and spun to see him mean-mugging Jay with a low growl coming from his chest again. Mac had been making intermittent growly sounds since I'd arrived. After seeing the man-polar bear transformation last night, I was quickly putting puzzle pieces together. The one that didn't fit was my reaction. An ominous, animalistic growl from a grown man should have been terrifying, yet the sound sent tendrils of pleasure curling through me, tickling my entire body. Ben pleaded. One song. Supplication from Wilson came next. One song, cuz? I rolled my eyes and shrugged. Fine, one song. After a ridiculous cheer, complete with whoops and howls, I glared at Ben. Then, awkwardly, I glanced around for the right place to stand. With his hand in the middle of my upper back, Mac led me to the rear of the fire truck. Here. I shook my head when he patted the rear step above the back bumper, indicating I should climb up. He nodded in response. Your stage, milady. I laughed and rolled my eyes. The guys grumbled behind us, and Mac suddenly grinned. It was a smile that took my breath away. Give them a show, and they'll leave you alone. Maybe. I'll help you up. Having that dazzlingly handsome man with his blinding smile focus his attention my way, I would have said yes to just about anything at that moment. His hands encircled my waist, and I was lifted onto the step as though I weighed nothing more than a hummingbird. The shiver of desire that wound through my body was immediate, intense, and triple X-rated. No man, and I do mean no man, had ever lifted me with such seemingly little effort. Reflexively, my hands clasped Mac's shoulders and held tight, even after I was firmly settled on the platform. You're strong, he winked. You're light as a feather. Feeling drunk off the contact, I snorted. His eyes darkened, and he held my gaze as his hands slowly released me, slipping from around my waist. And incredibly beautiful. I straightened and looked around. Ben was staring at me with a confused expression that sent a rush of guilt to my warm cheeks. Slightly breathless from the intense moment with Mac, I cleared my throat, ran my hands down my dress to smooth it, and licked my lips. Get it together, Mel. How was I supposed to sing when suddenly I couldn't remember how to breathe? I knew what they wanted, and if I was truly getting out of here after singing only one song, that song would have to be alive in your eyes. 
The guys quieted down the second I sang the first note, a cappella. Mateo was recording me with his cell phone, probably to show his wife later, and Ben grinned as he leaned over and lightly elbowed the woman next to him, who was obviously Haley. I had only gotten through the first couple of lines when the whole group joined in, singing along with me. The beat of your heart, the words on your lips, your love for me, always alive in your eyes. I tried not to, but I gave in and glanced at Mac. His dark blue eyes, laser focused on me, seemed to shimmer with a glint of molten silver. His gaze burned with the intensity of flames, never wavering from me while the same words of the same song I'd sung for audiences hundreds, no, thousands of times, suddenly took on a new meaning to me. An old song transformed and was reborn. Our gazes were locked. Only a few feet separated us. He'd called me beautiful. Not just beautiful. Incredibly beautiful. As the song came to an end, an undeniable passion flowed between us. Again and again, it seemed I had to remind myself that I had a boyfriend. Why did that fact always seem to slip my mind the moment Max's gaze settled on me? He extended a hand to help me down. When I hesitated, both his hands again wrapped around my waist, and he lifted me effortlessly. This time, even after my feet were firmly on the ground, Max's hands remained on me. We stood, gazing into each other's eyes, frozen as though in a trance. Even in four-inch heels, my face still had to tilt up to look into his. Your voice is magnificent. His had grown deeper, grittier, almost the same timber as his growls. My hands wanted to touch him as I searched his face. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but what I found was attraction, connection, a kindred soul. I couldn't even sense that part of me that had for so long felt hollow, as though something was missing. Where had that emptiness gone? I couldn't tear my gaze away. My brain sent the signal for my mouth to work, to thank him, but all I could do was stare. Caught in some sort of love-struck limbo, the world around us faded. I swayed closer. His scent was warm and male and delicious. I leaned into his chest, and his arms wrapped around me, holding me tightly. His eyes flicked to my lips. My jaw dropped with a breathy gasp. There was no stopping what was about to happen. It was inevitable. The magnetic force between us pulled us to each other. I couldn't keep myself from glancing at his lips, imagining them pressed to mine. Would I feel the shadow of beard growth rough against my skin? I wanted to find out. The low growl rolled from Mac like a purr as his fingers tightened, digging into my waist. I trembled in anticipation. He was going to kiss me. I was going to let him. Mal! Ben's voice cut through the haze and I jerked back. Mac's hands dropped. He turned away. My poor, denied heart banged around in my chest as my face and neck heated, no doubt as red as my dress. Meeting my cousin's eyes wasn't easy, especially with the look of reprimand he wore. Ben forced a smile. Ready to go? Haley finally agreed to meet me at Mimi's later. I nodded and accompanied Ben to the sidewalk out front. Yup, yeah, uh-huh, uh, ready. The guy said goodbye to me and I waved, but my mind was elsewhere, on another planet. Once we got to the sidewalk, I left Ben behind and practically ran back to the B&B &B and straight to my room where I shut the door, closing everything out. I needed to process what had just happened. Mostly, I needed to nix any discussion with my cousin about the fact that I'd almost just cheated on my boyfriend in front of him. Chapter 13 Mac 
It was probably for the best that Mel's cousin called her away. I'd been completely enamored by the woman, like, lost. In some sort of trance, reduced to a blathering idiot. But damn, she was beautiful and had the voice of an angel. When she was close to me, I couldn't fight her magnetism. I needed to stay away from her. I should have been thankful when I got Heather's text, asking if I could leave work early and that she needed me. I would have been if her urgency wasn't because Warren was having an episode and she wanted to get him to the hospital. Jenny was MIA again, and someone needed to care for Amethyst. I shot her a quick reply. On my way. Then I headed straight to their place. Heather was in the driveway, shifting her weight nervously from one foot to the other. Am was in her arms, and a pale Warren slumped in the wheelchair beside her. His face was contorted in pain, and, even though it was hot as balls out, he was trembling as though he was freezing. Heather and I exchanged glances. Hers worried, mine, I hoped, reassuring. I helped Warren into the passenger seat of Heather's car, closed the car door, then took Am from her arms. Warren had lost so much weight. He was a shell of the man he'd been six months ago. You sure you don't want me to tag along? No, no, Mac. We'll be fine. I'll call or text with news. I kissed her forehead. If you change your mind and decide you want me there, even if it's just for some emotional support, don't hesitate. Promise me. She managed a tight smile. I promise. With Am tucked in the crook of my arm, I stood watching in the driveway as Heather pulled out and drove her mate to the ER. This was nearly as hard on my sister as it was on her mate, and I pitied her once again for fate bestowing a human mate on her. Am spent so much time at my place that my guest room was now a nursery. She had a crib, rocking chair, changing table, and everything else she might need, including bottles, toys, diapers, and baby shampoo. It was still early, but I was restless. Worries about Warren, about Heather, and thoughts about Mel were a buzz in my brain. Instead of going straight home, Am and I took a stroll and ended up at Latte Love. Paige looked up from behind the counter, grinning when we stepped in. You brought Amethyst. I pressed a kiss to Am's head. Yep, my best girl and I are hanging out tonight. She's such a doll baby, she hesitated. How's Warren? Is he doing okay? I forced a smile and nodded. Heather is taking him in tonight, but he's a tough bastard. He'll pull through. We both knew I'd said those words for my benefit. I needed to hear them out loud. Paige blew out a sigh and shook her head. He is tough, all right. I just think the world of Heather and Warren. I'm praying for their family. Tell me what I can get you, Mac. I ordered a couple of croissant sandwiches, which she gave me two for one, since it was getting late and she wanted to get rid of the last of her baked goods, or so she claimed. I sat in a furry pink chair near the picture window, behind a potted palm that almost reached the ceiling. Paige seemed to have a thing for large plants. Am stared up at the fronds, fascinated. She reached for one, her chubby little baby fingers opening and closing as she nibbled the knuckles of her other hand and slobbered drool down her chin. I held her close and blew out a rough sigh of frustration. I hated that I had to just sit back and watch my sister go through such a tough time and that there was nothing I could do. I would give everything I owned if it would take away the pain and suffering she and Warren were going through. They were both good people and deserved better. For me, the worst part was being powerless, feeling helpless against fucking human diseases. Am yanked me out of my thoughts and into the present moment by grabbing my face and attempting to shove her slobbery fingers into my mouth. When I snapped my jaw together, pretending to bite them, she giggled and squealed before slapping the shit out of my cheek, leaving wet streaks of baby saliva. I barked a laugh and leaned far enough away that she couldn't do it again, but she pouted, so I moved back. Another rough slap, and I growled firmly but gently to get her to soften her blows. Her little shifter strength was intense. 
When I heard the bell over the door chime, and a second later, smelled a fragrance that teased a groan from my lips, I knew before I brushed the palm leaf aside who had entered. Mel. She looked as good as she smelled. She changed out of the formal dress and into a pair of leggings, an oversized t-shirt, and those combat boots. She somehow looked just as elegant and just as jaw-droppingly beautiful as she had when she was dressed to the nines. She must have sensed me staring at her. She turned, her eyes met mine, and I watched a pink blush bloom over her cheeks. She gave a little wave and turned back and forth a few times, as though debating whether she should come over to me. I told myself to drop the leaf back into place, not to give off mixed signals or encourage any interaction. Myself didn't listen. I smiled and nodded at her. Hi there. Didn't expect to see you here. She bit her lip and held up her finger to me. At the counter, she ordered a sandwich from Paige and then turned and looked as though she was at war with herself. That changed the second she spotted Am. Her eyes brightened and she inhaled sharply. Oh! Am smacked me once more for good measure and then reached out for Mel at the same time Mel crossed the room wearing a big smile, her eyes riveted on Am. Mel stopped in front of us, giggling. Can I hold her? I love babies. If I had any sense of self-preservation, I would have said no. I would have gotten up and run out of there as fast as my feet could take me. I didn't, but it wasn't entirely my fault either. Am and Mel made that impossible. The look in Mel's eyes was one of intense longing, and Am, she extended both arms and thrust them toward Mel, her little face straining as she fought to get away from me and closer to Mel. What the hell? I handed Am over and watched my little droodle bug wrap her chubby arms around Mel's neck. She immediately opened her mouth and covered Mel's face in jewel kiss. I laughed, the sound pained as I watched them. Sorry about her drool. Despite her huge smile, I was surprised to see tears gather in Mel's eyes. She blinked them away and eased herself into the seat across from me. Don't be sorry, I love it. She can drool all she wants. She's beautiful. Watching the two of them, I felt an overwhelming sense of warmth. It felt too natural, and she looked too good holding Am. Is she... yours? Her tone was oddly tight as she asked. Yes, I mean, no. Uh, kind of? Mel stared quietly with a brows raised slightly. I snorted. She's my niece. Grand niece, technically. My sister's daughter's baby. Her name is Am. Amethyst. Mel's shoulders relaxed and released a wistful sigh. That is a beautiful name. For a beautiful little girl. And fitting. Do you know the story in Greek mythology? No, I didn't know there was a story. Amethyst was a mortal on her way to pay tribute to the goddess Diana when she got caught in an argument between the gods and found herself face to face with tigers sent by Dionysus, the god of wine. To save her, Diana turned Amethyst into a statue of pure crystal that was so beautiful that when Dionysus saw it, he was overcome with sorrow and remorse and cried tears of wine. His tears fell over the statue, staining it and making it even more lovely. Am managed to hook two of her fingers into Mel's earring and was pulling at it. I leaned over and slid my hand around the back of Mel's neck to hold her steady as I unwrapped Am's fingers. She's beautiful, but she's handsy. Mel's pupils dilated, and the smallest breathy sigh escaped her parted lips as she looked up at me. I realized how close I was to her, how private our little corner was, and tightened my fingers on her neck, searching her face, desperate for a sign warning me to back away. Mel, tell me I'm invading your space. Tell me I'm pushing you too far. Just tell me to leave you alone. Instead, her lids fluttered and closed, her chin tipped up just the slightest bit. That was an invitation, an opening for me to kiss her. But if that happened, 
there would be no going back for either of us. Even Am had gone silent in the face of our tension. The entire cafe seemed to disappear. Mel? Her name was a moan on my lips as I drew closer. Three sandwiches already. I threw in some cookies that we had left over too. As Paige pulled back the palm fronds, I sank back into my chair, a guilty expression on my face. Mel cleared her throat and smiled at Paige, color creeping up her cheeks. Thank you for the cookies. I've got to get going. I watched as she stood up and with a flustered expression took the bag from Paige and stepped briskly toward the door. Mel, she looked back at me and bit her lip. Yes? Despite being horrified at my lack of self-control, I couldn't fight a grin. Can I have my niece back? Oh my God. She rushed back toward me and shoved Am at me. I am so sorry. Am instantly burst into tears. Paige stood back giggling. An almost kidnapping. That's a first for my shop. But Paige's voice could barely be heard over Am's howls. Mel groaned and hurried away. With one glance over her shoulder at me and a sympathetic and longing look at Am, she fled the shop. Am instantly squealed and her little hand flew out and slapped me. I know, I did screw that up, didn't I? Chapter 14, Mel. I'm a skanky ho. I am. I almost kissed a man who wasn't my boyfriend. Well, technically, he almost kissed me. But I would have kissed him back. And I'd wanted him to kiss me. I wanted him to touch me and kiss me and cart me off to some romantic, secluded spot and make love to me under the stars. I felt a connection to Mac, the kind of connection I'd been trying so hard to form with Adam. I never totally blamed Adam. In fact, I blamed myself more than him. I'd never felt a deep soul-level type of connection to a man, and I'd known more than a few smoking hot A-listers during my celebrity days. None had ignited the fires of passion in me the way Mac, the firefighter, did. There's irony for you. Adam was a good-looking guy. Ugh. I'd been with Adam for almost a year, yet I'd never felt for Adam anything like I'd felt for Mac tonight. And we hadn't even actually crossed that friendship line. I sent an SOS text to Ingrid. Then I remembered she was probably having the time of her life at Mimi's with the fire department and sent a cancel the SOS text. I was sprawled across the bed in the B&B, &B, lamenting my situation when the door burst open. Ah! I jerked upright and let out an embarrassing scream. Oh my God, what are you doing? Ingrid frowned and leveled me with a look. She didn't appear to have been having as good a night as I imagined. You sent me an SOS text. And I canceled it. I shouldn't have bothered you. Do you see this face? Her finger drew an imaginary circle around her face. I only wish you would have texted me an hour ago. That whole outing was a damp squib. She fell back on my bed next to me and pouted. Your brother's a wanker. I've been telling you. I was used to Ingrid's use of British slang. Even though she'd grown up in Syracuse with her mother, whose own British accent had never quite faded, Ingrid's summers were spent with her father in England. Every year when she came home to the States, her accent was stronger than ever. What did he do? No, no, I'm sorry. She squeezed my hand. This isn't about me and my stupid, one-sided obsession for your brother, who literally wants nothing to do with me. This is about you. Talk. Are you sure? Because I'm always willing to talk about how stupid my brother is. Same old, same old. Tell me, what happened? I sighed. I have to break up with Adam. Yes! She sat up and fist-pumped the air, then leaped to her feet. That is what I have been telling you. Her words were punctuated by her index finger as it jabbed the air. 
She let out a cheer, then seemed to remember herself. Her face dropped into a mock pout that would have fooled no one. I mean, oh, what's wrong, dear? Why ever do you think that? I hid a grin. You're an ass. I am quite aware of that fact, but we're discussing you. Tell me why you finally come to your senses. The firefighter, Mac, I almost kissed him. I held up my thumb and forefinger. I came this close. Or he almost kissed me, but I almost let him. I wanted him to. Twice. I sucked in a breath. Whether anything comes of this, whatever it is between me and Mac, the fact remains I have more feelings for Mac, a guy I've known for all of a couple of days, than Adam, whom I've been dating for almost a year. Adam Morrow is not my future. Mac. Mac. Oh shit, I don't even know his last name. Ingrid remained silent for a few seconds, leaving me to worry about how she was going to respond. That is his last name. His full name is Hamish McGregor. It's Scottish, but he's gone by Mac since he was a child. My jaw dropped. What? Don't look at me like that. Did you think I wouldn't investigate the man? I got the whole scoop, and you could do way worse. In fact, you are doing way worse with Adam. He's always been beneath you, and marrying a man because you don't want to enter your golden years without a partner is rubbish. There's more to it than that, Ingrid. I was worried about you, too. You work for them. I met him through you. She scoffed. You think they're going to fire me because you're dumping his whiny, spoiled, privileged arse? Yes, I do. He's incredibly petty. Finally, you admit it. She slapped my arm and laughed. And I thought marrying because you're getting older was a poor reason. Marrying so your friend doesn't lose her job is so much worse. Have more faith in me, Melody. She was right. It was a stupid reason. If they tried to fire Ingrid for such a stupid reason, I would help her fight it. I sat up and grabbed my phone. I'm going to do it. What? I looked at her and held up my phone, waving it in the air. I'm going to break it off. If you're sure you're prepared to handle the fallout, if they fire you, I'll help. I'll hire a lawyer. We'll sue. She hid a grin behind her hand and shook her head. No, no, I won't be suing if they fire me. I mean, I've been nicking office supplies for the last three months, and I'm pretty sure they know it. I've practically got my own office, Max. I'm fairly certain the only reason I haven't been fired yet is because of you. I shook my head. That's criminal behavior, you know that? I need an intervention. I can't help myself. I hate them, and I love office supplies. You know what? It doesn't matter. Call your boyfriend and make him your ex-boyfriend. Please. I can't wait to hear this. That tally whacker deserves it. Should we talk about how you're going to handle any retaliation they might throw at you? Not at the moment, no. Maybe I should wait and do this face to face. Stop procrastinating. Right. I grabbed my phone again and blew out a shaky breath. Okay, here goes nothing. The first call went to voicemail. Not wanting to be a complete asshole and break up in a recorded voicemail message, I hung up and called him right back. When he finally answered, he sounded pissed. Mel, it's fucking late. What is it? I hadn't thought through what I wanted to say exactly. How I wanted to say it. I panicked at hearing his voice and just stared at Ingrid with wide eyes. What was I supposed to say? Mel? My throat constricted, like it would rather close than allow words to slip through. I made a distressed face and waved my arm around, while Ingrid's face contorted with a stern, scolding look, and she used corresponding hand gestures. She was right. I had to do it. Balls to the wall, Mel. She must have butt-dialed me. Huh? Okay, that was unexpected. 
Ingrid's appalled expression spoke doubly for me. Who the hell was he talking to? Adam? My ears listened so hard, I swear I heard the faint rustle of his silk sheets. Mal, honey, hey, uh, what's up? Who's with you? A sense of frightening calm flowed through me. What? No one. What's going on, baby? Who are you talking to? Ingrid balled up her fist and shook it at my phone. I could hear the guilty defiance in Adam's voice. I knew I should feel a sense of outrage, maybe even yell and scream a little, but it would have been such a farce, and I didn't even want to waste the energy. The truth was, I didn't care whom Adam was with. No, that wasn't the truth either. The real truth was I felt relieved like the weight of the world had lifted from my shoulders. You're not alone. He stuttered. Uh, I, uh, there's no one here. It was the TV. Adam, it's time we ended this relationship. I think we both know it's not working. It felt so good to say the words aloud. This isn't what either of us wants, and not even because it's three in the morning, I recognize that voice, and I'm pretty sure you're cheating on me. It's because you and I clearly aren't happy together. What the fuck? It's over. I suddenly felt so light, so free, that a giggle escaped my lips. You and I are over, and it feels so good to say that. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but this was never right. <laughs> you know that. Oh, hell. What the fuck are you talking about? I've spent a year of my life trying to please you. Now you're just gonna walk out because you're having some fucking midlife crisis? When the sound of a woman's voice in the background became clear, I just grinned. Call it what you want. I don't care. Ingrid and I exchanged glances. I have plenty of time left to find my path, but I don't want to waste another second of the time I do have on you. I hope the woman warming your bed right now makes you happy, Adam. Good luck. As soon as I hung up, Ingrid all but exploded. I cannot believe he dared to imply you're middle-aged. That pig! Oh, I am going to shove my heel so far up his bum when I see him. And he's cheating on you, but still thinks you should move in and play the next Mrs. Morrow. Dirty, rotten bastard. I told you he was a pus-dripping knob, didn't I? I was already up and moving around the room, giggling as I stripped out of my leggings and shirt. I don't even care. None of that matters. I feel fantastic, like a new woman. She watched as I changed into cute underwear and a sundress. You're not angry? Also, what are you doing? I'm not angry. I feel great. I feel like I just lost that last 15 pounds I've been working on for the past 10 years. I'm free. I shoved my feet into my flip-flops and stopped in front of the mirror to see if my hair and makeup were still okay. You are right. I should have washed my hands of that man long ago. Where are you going? I'm going to try to find Mac. I know it's crazy, but dumping Adam just gave me a new outlook and a new motto. Carpe diem. I'm not waiting another second for my life to begin. There's something there between Mac and me, and I want to know what it is. She laughed and clapped her hands together. Yeah, there's my girl. Go out there and get your world rocked. I stood at the bathroom mirror, brushing my teeth and talking around the toothpaste foam. I love you. I'm sorry for SOSing you and then ditching you. Forget that. Go shag, you firefighter. I spit, rinsed my mouth, ran a quick brush through my hair, then grabbed my purse. This is going to sound crazy, and I'm sorry for dropping this bomb and running, but I think this island is... different. Different how? Magical? Ingrid's brows rose almost to her hairline. What? Just hear me out. I saw something the other night, I snickered. I saw a polar bear walk out of the water. Then the bear, 
It turned into a man. I bit my lip and shook my head. I know, it sounds insane, like I've lost my mind, but I really saw it. I think some bizarre things are going on here on Sunkiss Key. I knew it. Well, I didn't know exactly, but I prayed and prayed for it to be real, and it's finally happened. I just stared incredulously at her. This was not the response I expected, but at least she wasn't talking about having me committed. Don't look at me like that. I read paranormal romance all the time, and everyone knows that all fiction is based at least partly on fact. Is it such a stretch to believe that shifters exist? No, it isn't. It isn't? Of course not. You saw one yourself. So there really are people who can transform from human form to animal form. Ingrid was really taking this much better than I expected. My bestie snagged herself a shifter, she winked. Now, go get your groove back. Chapter 15, Mac When the knock sounded at the door, I winced. I was having a hell of a time with Am. She was a fussy little hellion tonight. She'd started screaming when Mel handed her back to me at Latte Love and hadn't stopped since. I made her a bottle, checked her diaper, rocked her, even tried singing to her, but nothing seemed to soothe her. Her cries alternated from loud, angry howls to tired, whiny howls. When I opened the door, Mel's scent washed over me, almost bringing me to my knees. Mel? Although she was the person at the forefront of my mind, she was the last person I expected to see at my front door. She changed into a sundress, leaving her long legs bare. A compliment was on the tip of my tongue, but then I noticed something miraculous. The second I'd opened the door and Am had seen Mel standing there. Her fussing ceased, that abruptly. Am was flashing Mel a watery, three-toothed grin and reaching for her so hard she almost tumbled out of my grasp. Mew, Mel gasped. She said my name. Mel snatched Am out of my arms and wrapped her in a hug. Before I knew it, Am was being held and cuddled and kissed and showered with attention by Mel. What just happened? We'd all been waiting to hear Am's first word, Mama, Dada, Nana. Hell, I'd been pushing for Uncle Mac, but Am hadn't said an intelligible word yet. It certainly did sound as though she just said Mel. In reality, it was probably just Am's typical gibberish that coincidentally sounded like Mel, but I wasn't about to say so and burst Mel's bubble. And damn, it was really good to see her at my door. Unexpected, but damn good. Am was now snuggling into Mel, resting her head on Mel's chest. It was unusual the way she took to Mel. I apologize if I'm interrupting. Not at all. I'm glad you're here. This is the first time she's quieted down since we saw you in Latte Love. But how did you... Ben. I called Ben, who was with Haley... I had him ask Haley for your address and whether she thought it was weird to stop by. What did Haley say? She said she only thought it was weird that I wanted to, but she gave me your address, <laughs> obviously. Am let out a contented sigh, and her little lids drooped heavily as she sagged against Mel. I suddenly realized we were still standing in the open front doorway. Come in, please, uh, come in. I stepped aside and extended my arm, gesturing for her to enter. She took a few steps and turned to face me. I grinned. Well, I'll be damned. You must have magical powers. I nodded at Am, who was already sound asleep. Let me put her down in her crib. I'll be right back. I told myself I needed to avoid her. I'd lectured, scolded, and begged my wolf to shut the fuck up. There was no way a mate fit into my life right now, especially not a human mate. And besides, she had a boyfriend. But seeing her here, at my place, she was like a breath of fresh air. I was struck with the overwhelming sense that she belonged here, 
and that sense overruled every carefully thought-out argument I'd made since she left Latte Love. When I returned to the living room, the first thing I noticed was her elevated heart rate. She was looking at the framed pictures on my mantle. They were all pictures of Am. I wanted to say something comforting, but as I searched for the words, she turned nervously. I really hope I'm not making a complete fool of myself. This is the boldest thing I've ever done, and I feel a little nauseated putting myself out here like this, but I came to ask. There's something between us, isn't there? Tell me I'm not imagining it. She shifted from foot to foot. I broke up with my boyfriend tonight. I should have done it months ago, but I held on. When I saw you earlier, I realized there's something between us, I think. You haven't said anything, though, so maybe it is my imagination. I don't know, maybe I've lost my mind? She took a step back. Oh, God, oh, this is mortifying, and I thought the tree incident was bad. I'm so sorry for bothering you. She turned to leave, but I reached out and grabbed her arm, tugging her back around and pulling her into my chest. When her body met mine with a soft exhale, I had an overwhelming urge to claim her, to brush her hair back, expose the soft, silky skin of her throat, and claim her with a mark to show the world that this woman was mine, that she and I had an unbreakable bond that I was the only man lucky enough to spend the rest of his days touching, kissing, and pleasuring the incredible woman in my arms. With a finger, I tilted her chin up and kissed her, softly at first. As her lips parted, I moaned, wanting to drown in her taste, to lick and kiss every inch of her. I drew her tighter against my erection, proving just how much I wanted her. Kissing Mel was dizzying, she gasped and clung to the back of my shirt, a little whimper breaking free from her lips. She raked her fingers through my hair and kissed me with a fervent passion, the same hunger with which I devoured her. When I picked her up in my arms, her legs wrapped around my waist. The heady aroma of her arousal teased and tantalized me. The heat between her thighs pressed against my cock. Damn, that alone was nearly enough to make me lose control. Gritting my teeth, I carried her to my bedroom and pushed the door shut with my foot. We have to be quiet, Am sleeping. She nodded and stroked her hand down over my face, and then behind my head to cup the back of my neck. You're the most beautiful man I've ever seen. I growled. I'm not beautiful. She nodded and bit her lip. You certainly are. Tingles of electricity tore through me as I trained my searing gaze on my mate. I needed to be inside her. I wondered if it was possible to ever get enough of her. Laying her gently on the bed, I slowly undressed her, kissing, tasting, and memorizing every inch of her. I need to feel you inside me, Mac. I feel like I won't be able to take another breath if I don't have you soon. My cock ached to be inside her. Making quick work of my clothes, I poised above her. Her eyes were heavy-lidded, her lips already red and swollen from my kisses. I growled, are you sure? Her eyes flicked up from my belt and she nodded. I want you in me. I buried myself to the hilt. My jaw clenched. I fought for control as the most pleasurable sensation rolled through me. My mate. Mel was on fire beneath me. Her hips never stopped moving, her core never stopped squeezing me. Her hands were everywhere. She cupped my ass, raked her nails down my back, ran her fingers through my hair. The rest was a blur of passion and pleasure. She cried out, moaned, panted, even begged. Our pace went from tender and slow to hard and fast until we both cried out, shattered by the intensity of our mutual orgasms. Gasping for breath, I collapsed next to her, with my face buried in the crook of her neck, at the very spot I'd almost marked her. She'd clung to me, shivers still snaking through her body. Time passed. I had no clue how long. Anne was still quiet. I was entranced by Mel, lost to the rest of the world. 
There was never going to be a world in which I didn't crave Mel with every single breath in my body. I realized that then. I was damned. Whatever intentions of self-preservation I had were fucked. But with Mel's soft body curled next to mine, I couldn't find it in myself to be upset about that. Chapter 16, Mel. I dozed off for a second, but we were both awake at the same time again, caressing each other in his bed. Mac's hands on my thighs imbued a confidence I hadn't felt since I was 20. If I'd been worried about the size of them, the way Mac was clearly obsessed with not only my thighs, but every part of my body cured me. It was impossible to be self-conscious of anything about myself, the way he looked at me and covered every soft curve, every rounded edge in kisses and heated touches. Was I too rough with you? He was lying with his head in my lap while I sat with my back against his headboard. He traced red marks he'd left on my hips. I couldn't recall if they were from the first time or one of the times after. I'm sorry. I ran my fingers through his short hair. You are perfect with me. I'm not a petite woman. You can be rough. He looked up at me and quirked an eyebrow. You are petite compared to me. Can I just say that I really, really like that about you? I grinned. His eyes heated and he pressed an open mouth kiss to my inner thigh. I can't get enough of you. I was so shocked by the way my body kept reacting to him. The simplest of touches had me ready for him all over again. I was sore, but it didn't matter. His kiss was gasoline to my fire. He read my mind and growled. No, I know you're sore. I frowned. I'm fine. Liar, I saw you walk to the bathroom earlier. You look like you've been riding horses. You sound entirely too proud of that. I rolled my eyes but grinned and leaned back against the headboard. There's something different about you, isn't there? Mac held my gaze and sat up. What do you mean? I wanted to ask if he was like the polar bear I saw, and I was pretty sure I knew the answer, almost positive. But on the off chance I was wrong, this night would probably come to a screeching halt. There was no coming back from crazy. Nothing, never mind. He shook his head. No, tell me. I promise whatever you say will be okay. Are you? Am I what? Are you? I curled my feet under me and tucked my hair behind my ear. Promise that you won't think I'm bananas. I promise. Okay. I took a deep breath. Are you a shapeshifter? He stifled a laugh. How do you know about shapeshifters? You are. I'm not bananas. You're not bananas. I gasped and leaned forward. I knew it. I scooted even closer and stared into his eyes. You're a polar bear, aren't you? He scowled and shook his head. No, I'm not a polar bear. Oh, tiger? Hell no. I was playing a game of let me guess what animal you are with the man I just slept with. I probably should have been downright shocked. Instead, I was excited. Laughing, I decided to tease him a little. Hmm, peacock? Mel, come on. If I wasn't mistaken, he was sitting up straighter and flexing. Well, if you are of the avian variety, your feathers are ruffled right now. Oh, please tell me you're not a turkey buzzard. Are you? He glared. No. Flamingo. Penguin. Housefly? Oh, I got it. Jackass? With a loud growl, he grabbed me and pinned me beneath him. You are the most disrespectful little woman ever. I giggled. Honestly, the way you like it when I run my fingers through your hair makes me think you're some sort of dog. I'm right, aren't I? I cupped his face and nodded seriously. You're a poodle. He nipped playfully at my neck, sending me into a fit of giggles. Not dog, wolf. 
and liking the way you touch me has nothing to do with being a shifter and everything to do with being touched by you. Hmm. I stretched up to kiss him. Can I see? He seemed hesitant. You're not weirded out? Not at all. I admit I had trouble digesting the whole thing at first. Kind of thought I lost my mind. But I know what I saw, and now I just think it's really cool that you can turn into an animal. I wish I could shift into an animal. Something pained crossed over his face, but he blinked it away. What would you be? I thought about it. I'd want to be something badass, like a cheetah or a wolf like you. Most likely, I'd actually be an oversized house cat. He raised his eyebrows. An oversized house cat. Yeah, the kind that lies around and sleeps all the time and expects to be fed between belly rubs. Laughing, he rolled off the mattress and stood at the foot of the bed. I rolled onto my stomach with my chin propped on my fist and watched him. I grinned as his eyes went to my naked ass. His growing erection was impressive and dangerously close to my eyes if he didn't move back. For the record, I'll feed you and rub your belly anytime you want. He rolled his shoulders. Are you sure you want to see this? I nodded. More than anything. He held my stare for a minute more, then nodded. He was there one second, and the next, there was a massive wolf in his place. Solid black with glowing silver eyes, he stood stock still, watching me. He was bigger than any wolf or dog I'd ever seen. The word hellhound flashed through my mind, except he was stunningly beautiful and didn't appear frightening, although there was no doubt he could be if he wanted to. I was mesmerized. Without even realizing I was doing it, I slid off the bed and moved toward him. I was almost surprised at myself when I reached out and buried my hand in his thick fur. I swallowed audibly. I wasn't afraid of him. I was just in awe. He nudged me with his nose and wedged his head under my hand. I smiled and rubbed his head, leaning into his strong body. You're beautiful. That got me a growl, but I didn't care. What did he want? Powerful, magnificent, ominous? He was all those things, but he was also the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I felt giddy. I was so happy. I wrapped my arms around his neck, completely overwhelmed by everything that had happened tonight. Mac was suddenly back in front of me, his arms wrapped around me. You okay? I gave him a silly smile. Yeah, I just... Wow. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. He stroked his hands through my hair and pulled me back to the bed. Come on, you look exhausted like you're barely standing upright. That's your fault. He wore me out. I wanted to talk more, but I was so tired. Chapter 17, Mac. Mel was sleeping so soundly, I didn't dare wake her. She was on her stomach, a soft little snore was floating on each exhale, and a puddle of drool was on the pillowcase under her mouth. I grinned as I watched her sleep. She was splendid. Everything about her, just unbelievable. Her giggles of excitement when she witnessed me shift were almost as pleasing to my ear as her lovely singing voice. I'd never been so proud of being a shifter as when she'd stroked my fur and called my wolf beautiful. My head puffed up like a balloon right then. My wolf was definitely still strutting proudly. I was the happiest I'd ever been. Okay, he was a little pissed I hadn't marked her. I'd wanted to. She was gorgeous, sexy, sweet, and she'd not only gotten rid of the leech she'd referred to as her boyfriend, but she'd also come looking for me. She came to me. Having a woman like Mel in my life was the biggest ego boost a man could experience, and I hadn't been all that humble to begin with. But Mel wasn't shy about what she wanted. She was quick-witted and talented. Her voice was the sweetest sound I'd ever heard and would forever be stuck in my head, no matter the lyrics that accompanied it. Unfortunately, 
None of that changed the fact that she was human. She was fragile. She could be easily broken. I rolled over, got out of bed quietly so as not to disturb her, and went into Am's room to check on her. The baby was sleeping just as soundly as Mel and had her little thumb tucked between her lips. A smile spread across my face as I stood in that perfect moment, marveling at what a lucky man I was. The moment lasted for about eight seconds. That was how long it took before panic set in. Reality struck like a lightning bolt. This all seemed perfect, sure. But right at this very moment, unbeknownst to anyone, and for absolutely no reason at all, Mel could have some dark, deadly disease growing inside of her, just like the cancer that was eating away at Warren. She could be sick already. Or it could happen next week, or next month. Her body could turn on her. Hell, Warren had seemed perfectly healthy and robust for years before there was any sign that he was sick. I could spend the next 10 years, 20 years, with Mel, only to have her stolen away by some vile, wretched, uncompromising human illness. Oh, God. I wasn't strong enough for that. I couldn't walk away now. It was too late for that. I was crazy about her. I wanted her next to me in my bed every night and still there when I awoke every morning. One night, and I was completely fucked. She owned me. There was a light knock on the front door. I ran back, grabbed my jeans from the bedroom, and stepped into them before answering. The moment the door swung open, Heather's nose twitched, her brows lifted, and she stared up at me. Her hands flew to her hips. I cleared my throat knowing I'd been busted by my big sister. She could definitely smell Mel all over me. Hey, Heather, what are you doing here? How's Warren? Well, 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 looks like someone finally got himself a life. She made exaggerated sniffing sounds. Oh, you naughty boy. Where is she? She's still here? I grunted and crossed my arms over my chest. Quit razzing me and answer my question. How's Warren? He's fine. He got IV fluids and he's back home sleeping, feeling much better. But we're not discussing my mate. You like her? I growled. What did I just say? I don't give a shit what you just said. She waved her hand in the air. You're not getting away without telling me. If not today, then tomorrow. Anyhow, I came to get Am. I figured she could sleep at my place tonight, since apparently Jenny's home for the night. Besides, a baby might cramp your style. She winked. Knock it off. It's perfectly fine if Am stays here. I can drop her off in the morning, I don't mind. But Heather was already in the room I'd set up for Am and leaning over the side of the crib. Jenny promised she'll spend a little time with her tomorrow, since she's actually home. She even asked about Am, for a change. I nodded and sighed. Okay. I hated to see Heather get her hopes up, but I'd lost all faith in Jenny. We have a lot to talk about soon. She studied me for a moment. You look different, and you were with a woman. I don't even remember the last time. Something is going on with you, little brother, and I intend to pry all the juicy gossip out of you sooner or later. Be warned. I followed her to the door. If you need me in the morning, call the station. I'll be on duty. My shift starts at seven. Thank you, Hamish, for everything. She stared at the ground, her voice going quieter. I don't know what I'd do. Hey. You're not gonna go get all mushy on me, are you? She snorted and whispered so as not to wake the baby. <laughs> me? Oh, hell no. You got the wrong she-wolf if you think that's gonna happen. This bitch is tough as nails. As I watched her walk along the path adjoining our condos with Am asleep in her arms, I quietly agreed. She certainly is. I waited until Heather was safely inside, then poured myself a glass of water and wondered what to do about my mate. 
Heather really was going to press me for details, and my sister was masterful when it came to eliciting confessions. She should work for the CIA or the FBI or Interpol. I couldn't tell Heather the real reason I had avoided claiming Mel. Not while she was going through the very thing I was hoping to steer clear of. Heather no longer had a choice. I did. From the bedroom, I heard a crash. Mel groaned. I just listened. Then Mel rushed across the bedroom to the bathroom. More groaning. I heard her throwing up. I raced to the bathroom to check on her and found her on her knees in front of the toilet. Her body convulsed as she choked and dry heaved. I sank next to her. Hey, you all right? What's going on? She lifted her head and her unfocused eyes danced around the spot I was squatting. Where did the Osmobile sleep? Her skin was pale, the skin under her eyes dark. She looked frail. The old, what's wrong, Mel? My chest tightened painfully, and I told myself that humans got minor illnesses all the time. It wasn't necessarily anything big. She could have eaten something that disagreed with her. She tried to pull herself up, but before I could grab her, she fell backward. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she landed hard, her shoulders hitting the tub with a painful sounding thud. I swore and pulled her into my arms. Her body was covered in perspiration. As a trained EMT, I'd always been good in a crisis. I tended to have the gift of clarity in emergencies. It was almost as if, in such situations, the world moved in slow motion and my brain sped up. Not this time. As I looked down at my mate, I froze. All my training was useless as my brain completely blanked. Hospital. That was it. Emergency room. I raced us toward the hospital and left the truck running while I ran her inside. I carried her up to the registration desk. Help. Now. The place was empty, so the young woman manning the desk pushed a button and called someone. Within seconds, two nurses rushed out, then one went back for a gurney. I laid Mel down, and as one did a cursory inspection, the other ran through a list, asking me a myriad of questions, most of which I couldn't answer. What's wrong with her? I didn't even recognize my own voice. I don't know, sir. I'll come and find you as soon as we know something. It wasn't until after I watched them wheel her through the set of swinging doors, and she was out of my view that something occurred to me. I burst through the doors and had a vague sense that one of the medical attendants was speaking to me, something about remaining in the waiting area and letting them do their job. Not sure, though, since I ignored everyone and everything that wasn't Mel. I focused in on her scent. As a wolf shifter, my sense of smell had been a great asset when I rode ambulances. I'd been so panicked and flustered, I hadn't even thought to concentrate on her scent and see what I could detect. The odor of disinfectant in the hospital hallway was overpowering, but I leaned close and used my nose to scan her neck, arm, shoulder. Hypoglycemia. She's hypoglycemic. Which made a lot of sense thinking back. Her symptoms of sweating, confusion, perspiration, and lack of coordination were all symptoms of acute hypoglycemia. Is she a diabetic, sir? I don't, I suppose, yes. She must be. Just get her some glucose. According to the identification badge clipped to her scrub top, I was talking to an RN named Stacy Thomas. Please, Stacy. Nurse Stacy Thomas's features softened and she patted my arm. We'll check her blood sugar right away and get an IV of dextrose going. Don't you worry. Now please, return to the reception area before I get my behind chewed. I turned and headed back slowly hating that Mel was being taken out of my view. My knees felt weak. This was what it meant to care deeply for a human. I slowly backed away, putting myself in a corner of the waiting room. I sat and hung my head in my hands, trying to keep the nausea from bubbling up in my stomach. I gripped my head. I'd been in this exact room with Heather as she waited for Warren's last surgery. I remembered her pacing, wringing her hands, pulling her hair, and praying to a god that she'd never spoken to before, all because her mate was human 
and easily broken. Every time I shut my eyes, all I could see was Warren's wheelchair. But instead of it being filled by Warren, it held Mel, slumped over, pale, and sickly thin as she battled for her life. I managed to hold out until Nurse Stacy came out and confirmed that Mel's blood sugar level had been dangerously low. I went home and snooped through Mel's purse. Sure enough, I found an insulin flex pen and a glucose monitor. I gathered all of that and Mel's remaining clothing and dropped everything off at the nurse's station. I considered stopping into Mel's room, but at the thought of seeing her in a hospital bed, hysteria threatened to choke me, so I got the hell out of there. I needed some breathing room before I ended up a patient there myself. Chapter 18, Mel. Waking up in a hospital threw me. It took me several seconds to process where I was, and several more before I put two and two together and figured out how I'd gotten here. I remembered the best sex of my life, Mac turning into a great big wolf. Then there was a fuzzy memory of feeling dizzy, getting up from the bed. Then nothing. Ugh, I must have crashed. How stupid of me. I should have checked my blood sugar right after the exertion of sex. I was released after a couple of hours. There was nothing wrong with me, not once my blood sugar was stabilized. After a full 24 hours, a text, and a voicemail later, I was forced to accept that Mac was not that into me. He hadn't responded to my text or my voicemail. I considered going to his home or the fire station to confront him face to face, but I refused to be that woman, one who didn't know a brush off when she got one. It hurt, though. I wish he'd just tell me why. Even a text. The hospital trip freaked me out. The sex sucked. You snore. Anything was better than being ghosted. He'd taken me to the hospital, dropped me off, and washed his hands of me. Worse, I hadn't seen that coming. A weight settled on my chest, an ache settled in my stomach, both refused to budge. I didn't know what it said about me, that I cared more about a brush off by Mac than I did about ending an almost year-long relationship with Adam. That one night with Mac had felt life-altering. Beyond the sex, there was a connection, one I'd never felt with another soul before. It was clearly one-sided. No, I didn't believe that. None of this made sense. Mac had feelings for me, I was sure of it. No one was that good an actor. Yet Mac had dropped me off at the hospital and hadn't looked back. Maybe he thought I had something contagious and was angry that I could have gotten him and Am sick. No, that didn't make sense either. He could have cleared that up with a text or phone call asking how I was doing. One thing was certain, I should have taken better care of myself. But to be fair, I had never had sex that had inspired so much physical exertion before, so I hadn't thought to check my sugar level. When Ben and Pierce decided to stay on the island an extra couple of days, Ingrid called off work saying she was sick. She claimed that if she was about to get fired anyway, she might as well stay and enjoy her last hurrah, as she put it. She didn't fool me. I knew she stayed to have another shot at Pierce. She all but worshipped my brother, who was a pussy hound and nowhere near good enough for her. When Pierce chartered a fishing excursion and took off this morning before Ingrid had even rolled out of bed, she was crestfallen. We met at Latte Love for coffee. Maybe we should go down to the beach. Not a bad idea. Ingrid smiled and looked me over. You look like a day of lounging on a beach chair and the sun might do you good. There's a place called Bayfront Diner near West Public Beach that the locals say has great food. We could grab a couple of sandwiches and stop at a convenience store for some cold soft drinks and spend the day enjoying sun, sand, and surf. That sounds amazing, actually. She went to her hotel to get changed, and I hurried next door to rise and shine. What a great idea. I couldn't wait to feel the sun on my body. I was digging around for my swimsuit top when my cell rang. It was Ingrid. Mel, 
You're not going to believe this. Pierce just came back from his excursion. Seems the fishing charter had engine trouble, and they had to refund the fee. Isn't that spectacular? Uh, yes? Yes! Pierce asked if I liked to go to the Maritime Museum with him. Well, technically, I asked if I could tag along with him and Ben, but same difference. I grinned. So, uh, what do you say? Can we postpone our beach going until tomorrow and do the museum today? Of course. I had no desire to go to the museum, but I didn't want to be a downer. But I'm actually lying down at the moment. I faked a yawn. Once I got back in the room, I realized how tired I was. I'd love to nap. Why don't you all go ahead without me? What? No! We can go to the beach and rest as we planned. No, Ingrid, I don't want to do that anymore either. Please, go. I'll feel less guilty about bailing on you if I knew you at least had something to do. Well, all right. If you're sure, then. I grinned. I'm sure. You're an angel, Mel. I'll call later. My suite had access to a beach that wasn't too bad. After ending the call, I stepped outside my suite and walked nearer to the water's edge, where I settled in a chair, fully clothed in a shirt and leggings. My heart felt trampled. I wrapped my arms around myself. Mac had just left me at the hospital. He hadn't even called to see if I was okay, and I could not for the life of me understand that reaction. Chapter 19, Mac I sat in the corner of Mimi's cabana, watching Mel slump over the bar and drink herself silly. Silently, I cursed her for being so careless. After the trip to the ER, you'd think she'd monitor herself a little better. Was this how she always behaved? As though her disease was something to play around with? Good God, she had to know people could die from uncontrolled diabetes. Every time she ordered another drink, I fumed and fought to keep myself from marching over there and ripping the damn thing out of her hand. To top it off, I hadn't seen her check her blood sugar level once. If she had, I would have noticed, since I was watching her like a hawk. Was the woman trying to kill herself? And where the hell was her entourage? Her brother, her cousin, her friend Ingrid? Someone should be with her. My anger was only slightly stronger than my guilt. The light in her eyes had dimmed, and I blamed myself for that. She was sad and drinking herself silly. Fuck. I cursed her for being careless, but I also cursed myself for being such a dickhead. She didn't deserve this pain. She was too good to have to deal with the dickheads of the world, like me. I kept the brim of my cap low and nursed my vodka tonic. It killed me to see her hurting, and even more so to know I caused it. But just the thought of us spending 20 years together, then having to go through watching her wither and die? I couldn't do it. The more bonded we became, the harder it would be. Cutting it off now was best for both of us. Except I couldn't seem to pull myself away from her either. At least not right at the moment. Someone needed to keep an eye on Mel. I had to at least act as her bodyguard for the evening so I could trust she was safe. When Mel stood abruptly and swiftly left the bar, I threw a few bills down on the table to cover my drink and a decent tip, and waited for her to get a head start so she wouldn't notice she was being followed. Before her empty glass was removed from the bar, I crossed the room to smell the contents. I wanted to know just what I was dealing with. I sniffed again, deeper this time. My brow furrowed. I looked up. Mimi was shooting me a knowing glance. Diet Coke. So she wasn't drinking alcohol? Mimi shook her head. Not a drop. Relieved, I left the bar to see if I could pick up Mel's trail. She may be sober and her blood sugar may be within the optimal range, but I still didn't like the idea of her wandering around the island at night alone. I started to head in the direction of Rise and Shine B&B but Mel's scent trail led elsewhere. Discreetly, I sniffed the air again. I followed her scent down to the water's edge. Her clothes were in a pile on the sand. Oh no, she wasn't swimming, was she? Damn it, the waves were too rough. Tension stiffened my body as I scanned the water. 
My night vision was good, but I didn't immediately see Mel, which sent a chill down my spine. The waves were deceiving. They may not look all that big, but they were powerful. Finally, I spotted her wading about waist deep. What the hell was she doing going for a swim? She was too delicate and fragile, and alone. As though my words had a prophetic effect, I watched a large wave pick up momentum, crest, and crash over Mel's head. Her cry of alarm was cut short. She was knocked off her feet and dragged under. I didn't bother with my clothes, no time. I ran full speed through the sand, then the water, to the spot I'd seen Mel go under. I kicked my legs and moved my arms, trying to locate her. I went under, but there was no use trying to see under the water in the darkness. Even my shifter night vision wasn't helpful. I fought the waves, swimming as much as I could. The current dragged her somewhere, but where and how far? A wave knocked me off my feet, and then I was under too. I had the benefit of being shifter strong and an excellent swimmer, but still, it took me too long to get back to the surface. I knew right then and there that I was not going back to shore without Mel. I would die out here in this water if that was what it came to, but out here in this water was where I'd stay until I found her. If I found her. I swam farther and again ducked under, swimming near the sandy bottom, hoping to be lucky enough to stumble upon her by chance. And I did. My heart slammed to a stop in my chest. She was lying near the bottom, and she wasn't okay. I had to move quickly, every second counted. With every ounce of strength I had, I fought to scoop Mel up, and gripping her tightly, yanked her above water. The waves crashed around us, my mouth, nose, and eyes stung of salt water. I didn't think Mel was breathing. I slapped her face, hoping she would suck in a breath of air. She didn't. She hung there, limp, lifeless. No, no, no. I needed to get her to shore. Another wave crashed over us, but I managed to keep us upright. I had to save Mel, fast. I focused all my strength on fighting the current and keeping Mel's head above the water, which wasn't easy. I kept going under time and again myself. I wouldn't let her go. I would not let her go. If this fucking bastard ocean took Mel, it would take me too. When I finally managed to drag us both out of the water, fatigued by my battle with the sea, my feet sank into the sand, but I quickly laid Mel out on the ground and started CPR. I blew a sharp breath of air into her lungs, followed by chest compressions, and then repeated it. Mel was cold. Her lips were blue. Between my breaths and chest compressions, my head rolled back, and I let out a pained howl of anguish at the moon before continuing. And continuing. It felt like hours that I'd been giving her CPR. Hours. Her slender body jerked under me, and she lurched sideways, choking and coughing up water. My chest heaved, and I turned away to flop down on the sand beside us. She'd almost died. She would have if I hadn't been following her. She'd been seconds from never returning. Her voice was broken and rough as she sat up and looked at me. What happened? Mac, is that you? Are you crying? I was, I guess. No, not crying, sobbing. Racking sobs of emotion, anger, fear, relief, and gratitude poured out of me. I couldn't speak. Instead, I pulled her against my chest and held her. Her heart rate was accelerated, but at least it was still beating. Her blood sugar. She needed to check her blood sugar. I sat up with her. I couldn't seem to be able to force my arms to release her. You may need glucose. My voice sounded almost as much like a bullfrog as hers had. I carried her over to her pile of clothes, and she somehow managed to find her monitor and check her blood sugar while still wrapped in my arms. Then she slumped against me. Let's get out of here. Yes, perfect. I couldn't get her far enough away from the ocean right then to suit me. Hell, I'd be happy to drive her to Kansas. Standing, I held her in my arms, carrying her nearly the length of the island back to Rise and Shine B&B. I carried her up to the porch of the B&B &B and inside. Penny was at the desk. She gave me a strange look but said nothing. 
She knew me, and I have no doubt she was able to discern that neither Mel nor I was in the mood for small talk or conversation of any sort. I didn't even ask Mel which room was hers. Didn't need to. My nose told me. I pushed open the door to her room, kicked it closed behind her, and carried her into the attached bathroom. I didn't bother to remove any of our clothes. I just turned the hot water on, and with Mel still in my arms, stepped under the steamy spray. I leaned back against the tile wall and blinked as tears burned my eyes. I'd almost lost her forever. When she lifted her head and touched a shaking hand to my cheek, I buried my face in her wet hair and choked back sobs. You saved me again. Her voice broke and she wiggled, trying to get down, but I couldn't let her go. Mac, put me down. I can't. I held her tighter, my nose pressed against her neck, breathing in her scent. She was beginning to warm up. Her heartbeat was strong, but I couldn't shake the image of her lifeless body from my head. Seeing her like that, I'd never felt so helpless in my life. I knew how lucky we were. We just faced a situation most people would not have survived. Burying my face in her wet hair, I reached a state of calm. You were gone. I shouldn't have done that. It was so stupid. I was just angry and frustrated and not thinking. If you hadn't been there. An angry snarl rose from my throat. Don't say it. I can't think about it. I'm barely holding it together after seeing you like that. I turned the water off and carried her into the room. I set her on her feet long enough for us to remove our clothing, then handed her a thick, complimentary terry cloth robe and wrapped a towel around my waist before draping our soaked clothes over the shower rod. I didn't say another word as I got us both under the blankets and held her tightly against my chest, pressing kisses to her forehead, temples, and eyelids. I'm sorry. She held me just as tightly. I'm so sorry. I pulled the blanket over us completely, burying us in our little cocoon. I just needed to know that she was okay, and to forget what I'd seen. Even when hours had passed and she'd fallen asleep, I held her. I knew I'd never be the same again. Tonight had proven how fucked up mating was. Sometime in the middle of the night, I got up, scribbled a note, a final goodbye, and then I slipped out. Chapter 20, Mel. Leaving Sunkiss Key meant giving up on Mac. And I was. I blocked his number on the off chance he might try to call, although I knew that was a long shot. The vacation fling was over, and I made a vow never to return to the island. Mac didn't know where I lived, so goodbye was goodbye. And that was the way he wanted it. I was gloomy and depressed, and I didn't even try to hide it. As Ingrid drove us off the island and to the Miami airport, she hummed along with the radio, but I could feel a melancholy in her too. We were an unhappy pair. I shed silent tears while staring out my window, and we didn't talk until we were at the airport. Even then, it was only a few words here and there. I wanted to apologize for being the biggest downer ever, but I couldn't figure out how to even begin the conversation without crying. Pathetic. The flight back to Syracuse wasn't long, but by the time we got our luggage and an Uber to take us home, I felt like I'd run a marathon. Ingrid rested her head on my shoulder in the back seat of the car, and that small contact made me feel marginally better. I was worried she was mad at me for ruining her much-deserved vacation. Ingrid insisted on coming with me to my house instead of going home to hers. She helped me bring everything inside, and then we both sprawled on opposite ends of the couch and stared up at the ceiling, neither of us speaking. My phone rang somewhere in the house, but it didn't matter. I just ignored it and focused on breathing through the tightness in my chest. What a trip, huh? I turned my head to look at Ingrid and rolled my eyes. I ruined it for you. I'm sorry. You didn't ruin anything for me, Mel. 
the moment I watched Pierce pick up a random twat in the pub and take her back to his hotel room, it was ruined, she sighed. I'm glad I could help take care of you. You've been the one caring for me for some time now. It was my turn. I blinked back tears. We take care of each other. I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm bloody sorry you got your heart broken. You don't deserve that. I groaned and rubbed my eyes. It makes no sense for me to take it so hard, right? I mean, I barely knew him. A couple of short conversations, some really amazing sex. And then there was that whole hero thing. You know, rescuing me from being stuck in a tree and saving my life. Twice. Smoking hot, heroic firefighters who repeatedly save lives are overrated. I had these crazy ideas, Ingrid. I'm so embarrassed now. Tears started leaking from the corners of my eyes. That night I went to him, it just felt so right. When I woke up in bed with him, I couldn't stop thinking about how right it was and how I wanted to do just that every single day for the rest of my life. Such an idiot. You're not an idiot. I fell for a guy that was supposed to be a vacation fling. How the hell could I miss him like this? And that beautiful little baby. My heart just opened right up to both of them, as though I'd known them their whole lives. She clicked her tongue. I'm so sorry, Mel. Maybe it'll fade as fast as it came on. I didn't think it would. You know what the worst part is? The worst damn part? I still have some stupid sliver of hope that maybe he'll come after me, that he'll track me down and come bursting into my life to profess his love like some stupid asinine romantic comedy. You know, like Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. You complete me. Oh, honey, I cried harder. I know, I'm so stupid. No, you're not stupid. He's stupid. Men are stupid. When my phone started ringing again, she groaned and went to find it. It had better be an emergency. What kind of bell and calls multiple times in a row? I heard her swear from the other room. Who is it? Adam. He's called 17 times. I winced. I haven't checked my phone. The one person I wanted to call me didn't have my number, so what was the point? She came back into the room and waved the phone at me. Should I get rid of him? I shook my head. I don't want to get you into any more hot water than I have already. I blew out a deep breath. I had to face the music and deal with Adam sooner or later. I owed him at least that, I guessed. As soon as I answered, though, it was obvious he just wanted to hurl insults at me. I can't believe the nerve of you. Do you have any idea what you did? I could practically see the foam collecting at the sides of his mouth. My mother is livid. Sighing, I tried to stay calm. I'm sorry, Adam. You're right, I could have handled that breakup better. Ingrid was expressing her disagreement by making faces and obscene hand gestures at the phone. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I truly am. <laughs> hurt me? Mel, you may think your dried up old cunt is something special, but I assure you it's not. What you hurt was my goddamn bank account. My mother promised to retire and hand over the reins of the company to me when you and I married. Now, that offers off the table. Your actions did damage to my livelihood. That's what you fucking cost me. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. I plan to sue for compensation. I pulled the phone away from my face and stared at it. Already tired and emotionally raw, my anger was quick to surface. Yeah? Good luck with that. You are completely out of your mind, Adam. You want to bring a frivolous lawsuit to the courts? Go for it. I ended the call and rolled my head back and stared at the ceiling. It was suddenly hard to fathom that I had ever been under the delusion that being with Adam was a better choice than growing old alone. Chapter 21, Mac Mel was no longer on the island. I knew because, well, I just knew. 
The entire island was different without her. Something in the air had changed. It was heavier. The sun, while just as hot, didn't seem nearly as bright. I should maybe feel pleased that I'd saved us both from falling into a deeper bond. I hadn't been thinking only of myself. Sure, as a human, Mel was naturally more susceptible to ailments or injuries, and as a shifter, I was tough. But fighting fires was a dangerous profession. I didn't want her to have to suffer from a broken mating bond either. And I felt like shit. Absolute shit. I went through every day like a zombie. I went to work, I cared for Am, I helped with Warren. Lather, rinse, repeat. It had looked for a while as though Warren had taken a turn for the worse, but he surprised us all. His round of chemo ended, and he was looking and feeling better every day. He was still in the wheelchair for a portion of the day and tired easily, but he had color in his face, and instead of the droopy weariness, he was gaining strength. Jenny had gone MIA, so unless I was at work, Am was with me. The child was going through major growing pains. She was never happy. She fussed and whined and threw tantrums. She did say her one word, though. Mule. Mule, mule, mule. She said the same damn thing on repeat as though she were trying to tell me something. And maybe she was, but I refused to listen. I avoided Parker or anyone else who wanted to ask about Mel. I just kept my head down, reminding myself repeatedly that I'd done the right thing, regardless of how miserable I felt without her. The misery I was experiencing was nothing compared to how it would feel if I had to watch her slow descent toward death's door. I told myself to give it time, but it had been over a week since she'd left, and I only felt worse. It didn't help that my wolf was inconsolable. He was angry and sullen. Lately, I couldn't even shift. When I tried, he fought, refusing to emerge. It wasn't a complete surprise when Heather called me over to her house one night. She and Warren were seated at the dining room table. Warren's face was pulled taut, but his eyes were sharp. He and Heather exchanged glances before my sister went on the attack. What's going on with you, Hamish? You've been singing the blues for over a week. I grunted. Nah, that's light jazz. I'm serious. Something's going on with you, and I want you to spill. You need to tell me. I can't handle worrying about you two right now. I'm fine, Heather. You've got enough going on here. Heather glanced at the clock. Then she pointed back and forth from me to her. We're not done here, but something's going on with Jenny. I told her I'd call it four, and I wanted you to be here. Heather held her cell to her ear, and when Jenny answered, she put the call on speaker and laid it on the table. Hi, honey. You're on speaker. We're all here. Me, Dad, and Uncle Mac. Bonus. Then you can all get the news at once. Jenny sounded defiant, almost argumentative. Heather glanced at me, then she and Warren locked eyes. We're listening. I'm getting married. Tension filled the room. Jenny, where are you right now? My words came out sounding harsher than I had intended. Heather held up a hand to silence me. That's wonderful, honey. Who's the lucky man? I'm in Seattle. Joe and I are tying the knot. Then we're thinking of heading down to California for a time. Warren's jaw was working. It was obvious it was taking extreme effort for him to remain calm. Jenny, you're not the only person affected by your decisions. Your choices affect your daughter, too. I know that. You act like I'm stupid. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. My patience was thin. How can you just move Am away from her grandparents and uncle who love her? Not to mention, we're your support system. You're really just going to up and whisk her away like that? I'm not taking Am. The table finally fell silent, and I felt my stomach clench as Warren's head drooped and his shoulders sagged. Heather went to him and wrapped her arm around him. Sweetheart, Am is a wonderful child. You'll come to love her as much as we all do. You just need to be around her more, get to know her better. Please, come home for a while. Spend time with your daughter. 
I'm not implying you should end the engagement, only that there's no rush. Am, am, am. I tell you, I'm getting married, and that's all you can say. None of you give a shit about me. I rolled my eyes. Jenny, we all care about you. I don't want to get to know her. I don't want to be a mother. The only reason I had her was that you guys would have been disappointed if I'd had an abortion. Tears pooled in Heather's eyes. Warren slumped in his wheelchair. I stepped back, feeling as though I'd been physically struck by Jenny's words. You can't mean that. I do. I really do. I won't ever come back. Joe and I will make it on our own. I looked over at Am, who was in the living room, sitting on a blanket spread out on the floor, playing with her toys while the tense conversation went on around her. Jenny, what? I don't want a daughter. I should have gotten an abortion. I don't want any of this. I just want to live my life. If you like her so much, you take her. Jenny, you can't just give your child away. I focused on Heather and Warren. Tell her she can't just give her child away. People do it all the time, Uncle Mac. There's even a word for it. It's called adoption. Jenny huffed. Someone will take her. She's a cute kid. I growled. A honk sounded through the phone in the background. Gotta go. Don't call me. I'll call you. She giggled, as though the whole thing was some big joke to her. Stunned, I just stared at the phone, wondering what the fuck had just happened. I glared at my sister. How could you just let her get away with that? She looked up from Warren and broke into sobs. I, I don't know what else to do. Warren had tears streaming down his face. I swore and moved over to them so I could rest a hand on both of them, while Heather fell apart in Warren's arms. I'm sorry. I'm just angry, Heather. You didn't do anything wrong. That girl is just... Ugh. Heather sniffled. She's just young and confused. I ground my teeth to keep my opinions of my niece to myself. What about Am? Heather pushed her shoulders back and lifted her chin. She's our granddaughter. We'll take care of her. I stared at the two of them, both barely holding on as the stress and fear weighed them down. No, I want to adopt her. What? I cleared my throat and nodded. I could look confident, even if internally I was shitting my pants. I'll adopt her. I couldn't love Amethyst more if she were my own daughter, and I've been taking care of her for months. I've loved her from the first day I saw her. She needs so much, and you're both already so overwhelmed. Please? Warren looked up at me and covered my hand with his own. We appreciate everything you do for us. Don't think we haven't noticed and aren't grateful. But we won't burden you with our grandkid, Mac. You have a life. From what I heard through the gossip vine, you have a mate that you're being stupid about. You don't need a kid. You don't understand. Am is not a burden to me. And I meant that. I didn't realize how much I meant that until I heard the words from my own mouth. Being a single dad isn't perfect and won't be easy, but I'm already doing it. Unless you're going to tell me that you can balance everything going on and a little one who will be walking soon, I think you should consider letting me take her. Warren and Heather stared at each other. They were clearly having a silent mental conversation. It dawned on me that I hadn't adequately expressed my feelings. No, wait a minute. It's not like that. We're talking about Am as though she's a thing we have to hand off, but that's not it at all. It's not who will take her. I want her. I want to be a dad to her. I want to teach her how to read and throw a baseball and cook a mean eggplant parmesan. I want to drop her off on her first day of kindergarten and be the one to go to parent-teacher conferences. I feel, in my heart, that Droodle Bug is supposed to be with me. Heather was eyeing me with an odd expression. What if Jenny comes back and tries to claim parental rights? It could get messy. Jenny's our daughter, and despite our disappointment with her right now, we will never turn our backs on her no matter how misguided she is. And Am is our granddaughter. We're all family. I'd never keep Jenny away from Am, or vice versa, unless it was in Am's best interest. 
I had little hope that Jenny would see the light anytime soon, and in the meantime, Am deserved a good life with a parent who loved and truly wanted her. We'll figure that out if we get there. The reality of the situation settled over us, and I found myself sinking into the chair across from Warren. Resting my hands on the table, I sighed. Life throws curveballs. Yeah, Warren barked a laugh. It sure does. Then he looked longingly over at the liquor cabinet they kept locked up tight and sighed again. I'd kill for a whiskey. Heather kissed the side of his head and sat beside him. No. Warren shook his head and looked back at me. So, tell us about this mate and why you won't be with her because she's human. Heather's eyes narrowed. Yeah, tell us about that. I held my hands up. Not much to tell. She's not right for me. The lie didn't feel great. It is what it is. She's gone, and I don't know where she went. Easy as that. What's wrong with a human mate? Warren grunted. Besides the obvious. Heather watched the way Warren gestured to his beat-down body, and her eyes narrowed as she looked back at me. Yes, Mac. Tell us why you're not willing to mate with a human. I growled. You know why. Warren looked between us and then scoffed. Me? You won't take a human mate because of me? He means because you got sick. Heather scowled and stood up. Marching over to the liquor cabinet, she grabbed the whiskey and took a long pull from it. You're really that big of a chicken shit? Warren stared at the bottle but spoke to me. That's fucked. Your sister and I have had worlds together before this. You know that. You saw some of them. Heather slammed the cabinet shut and glared at me. You rejected her because you're afraid. I couldn't do this, Heather. I swallowed and looked away. I wouldn't be strong enough. If you don't go after your mate, you're a fool. Warren wheeled himself away from the table. Come on, Heather. Bedtime. You'll never forgive yourself if you waste more of the time you could have with her, Hamish. Promise you that. Heather shook her head, her disappointment in me palpable. I rubbed my chin, then bent over and scooped up Am. I need to get her to bed. We can talk more tomorrow. They didn't argue with me as I collected the baby and her toys. Holding Am against my chest, I felt tears prick my eyes. Am had been rejected and abandoned by her mother because Jenny was a selfish brat. I didn't miss that irony that Mel had also been rejected and abandoned, all because I was scared to death. Chapter 22, Mac. Between Am, my wolf, and missing Mel, I was a basket case. After putting Am down to sleep, I sank into my couch. I couldn't remember a time when I'd felt so exhausted. Exhausted and unable to sleep. I was barely eating. My days were filled with an unhappy baby whose life was undergoing a lot of changes. Somewhere along the line, she seemed to have started blaming me. Or maybe I was just the closest one around as she acted out. She growled at me all the time and had recently taken to biting me. If you think a small mouth with only three teeth didn't hurt, think again. Those little bites stung, but they hurt my feelings even more. All her little baby frustration seemed to be coming out at me. I had broad shoulders, I could take it. I only wished I could take all of her burden. It wasn't right that a little one her age should have anything to cry about, except to let me know it was time to eat or change her diaper. I only wished I could take on all her anger and frustrations for her, or that I could communicate to her, let her know that from here on out, I would be her rock. I'd never let her down. My wolf was another bone of contention. He was still not playing fair. He fought constantly. He stopped refusing to shift, and now I struggled against uncontrolled shifts, and at the most inopportune times. No matter how much I told myself it was crazy, I couldn't help wondering if they were both mad at me for the same thing. I missed Mel, too. I could still smell her in my house. 
It was late, later than Am should have been up, and I couldn't stop feeling the worst loneliness creeping over me. It felt like I would be that way forever. The thought of missing Mel this much for the rest of my life gave me chills. The more time passed, the more my decision made less and less sense. I didn't know how I could go on feeling the way I did. I'd shunned my mate. Every day was just a replica of the day before. I got up feeling crushed, took care of Am feeling crushed, went to bed feeling crushed. I worried that I'd been wrong. Even as I thought it, though, I felt the same panic I'd felt the night she'd passed out. I'd been helpless. She could die right in front of me from a cold gone wrong. Humans were so weak. I sat forward and held my head in my hands. I had to do something. I had to at least check on her. Not knowing how she was doing since she'd left the island was killing me. Even though I felt like I was breaking the rules I'd set for myself, I pulled out my phone and dialed McClintock. She answered on the second ring and grunted. What do you want, Mac? Groveling had never been my style. I need your new boyfriend's number. Silence for several seconds. Is this about Mel? I just need to talk to Ben. That's not what I asked. No, I'm just, I just need to talk to Ben. I blew out a rough breath. Okay, yes, it is about Mel. I need to see if she's okay. Newsflash, dumb fuck, she's not. Her mate rejected her. You men, I swear, the only reason y'all wear your head on the end of your neck is to make you look taller, she growled. I'll text you his number. I hung up and waited for the text. As soon as it came through, I dialed Ben's number. I couldn't wait after deciding I was going to check on her. Ben answered, sounding confused. Yeah? Ben, it's Mac. I started to say more, but he went from zero to furious, protective cousin instantly. Oh, you fucker. Why are you calling me? Trying to make sure you did a thorough job of fucking my cousin over? I grunted. How is she? Are you fucking kidding me? He swore. Mel is great, fantastic. She's back with her ex and they're talking about marriage. I was on my feet, furious. My wolf howled in my head. No, she is not. No, she isn't. She's pouting and mopey and mourning you for some godforsaken reason. She's fucking depressed as hell. And with every single wedding she sings at, it gets worse. Happy? Or do you want to hear more of the gory details of how you snuck out in the middle of the night and trashed a good woman? I sank back onto the couch. No, I don't want to hear that. Then why are you calling me? I searched for the words I wanted to say, but none of them were meant for Ben. They were all for my mate. I don't know. Then fuck off. He hung up on me and left me reeling, wondering what the fuck I was doing. My phone rang and I answered it, hoping it was Ben again with advice. Yeah? How's Am? Heather's voice was soft and I knew that Warren was sleeping near her. Sleeping? I'm pretty sure she hates me. Get used to it. That's par for the course when you have a kid. She sighed. The lawyer in Seattle called. Jenny stopped in and signed the papers, relinquishing parental rights. It's just a matter of the formal adoption going through the courts, which should only take a matter of weeks. I walked over to Am's crib and looked down at the sleeping little droodlebug who had me wrapped around her little finger. I'll never understand her. Everyone makes mistakes, Mac. This is Jenny's. I hope she'll wake up and see that one day. She released a wobbly sigh and cleared her throat. I really thought she might change her mind and come home. I'm sorry, Heather. I quietly backed out and closed the door to Am's bedroom. I sat on the living room couch. Just tell me what and when and I'll be there. She hesitated. There's something else. I didn't like the way she sounded. Had she and Warren changed their stance about supporting me and adopting Am? A terror snaked through me. I would always be Am's biological great uncle, and I would be in her life regardless, but I had my heart set on being a dad to her. What is it, Heather? 
Hope you and Warren aren't offended by how happy I am that AIM's going to be officially mine. I know this is tough for you. Actually, Warren and I are thrilled. We think you are just what AM needs, and we know we'll still get to be doting grandparents to our granddaughter. Of course. So, you said there was something else? You're not going to like this, but we talked about it, and if you want our full support, we need you to go to Melody and repair the damage you've done. She sighed. Before it's too late. My chest tightened. What do you mean? Don't play dumb with me. You know what I mean. You're so afraid of causing pain and so hung up on trying to prevent it that in the process, that's exactly what you're doing. Causing pain to both of you. All three of you. You don't know what you're saying, don't I? I shook my head even though she couldn't see. Look at you, Heather. I have a hard time accepting that you truly believe that. You've been through hell. You and Warren both. You're suffering. Don't tell me you're not. I know you are. Yes, of course. You see us suffering through a difficult time, sure. What you don't see are the moments I have with Warren when no one else is around. The way we still get to cuddle in bed, or the way we spend hours talking while we're waiting around for his appointments. We've never been closer. But, I mean, what if, uh, what if he dies? I was startled by how easily she said it. Yes. If he dies, I don't know. Maybe I'll die right along with him. And if I don't, I'm fairly certain that at least a major part of me will go with him. We're a pair. He's my other half. Without him, I will be lost. But nothing in life is guaranteed. I'm grateful for every second I've gotten to spend with my mate. Everybody dies. Most of us don't know if it'll be today, tomorrow, ten years from now, or fifty years from now. She let out a sigh. Hamish, I know you've seen so much suffering. I know those years of being on duty, fighting fires, and working as an EMT in Cleveland. You've seen some horribly tragic sights. People suffering unimaginable losses. But I want to ask you something. Let's say these are my mate's last days. Do you think that if I could go back and do it again, knowing what I know now and how it all ended, I'd do it differently? Heather, I see the new lines on your face, the circles under your eyes, the fatigue in your posture. In a heartbeat. What? As much as this illness sucks, I wouldn't trade the pain of watching the man I love suffer for one second of the time I've spent with him. Not a single second. I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. You know why? I grunted in response. It was worth it. It was worth it. We don't always get to choose what happens to us in life. But five minutes of sheer bliss is worth a hundred years of nothing special. Because it's those moments of bliss that make life worth living. You are not a coward, Hamish. I growled. It's not about being a coward. Yeah, it is. You're too scared of what might happen to enjoy the good fortune that is happening. Let me know when you've made an honest attempt at winning your mate back. Then we'll talk about Warren and I supporting you through the adoption process. You're serious? Very. Go and find your bliss, Hamish McGregor. I stared at my phone after Heather hung up my heart beating out a painful rhythm. Then, my stomach roiling, I dialed Ben back. As soon as he answered, I jumped in. Don't hang up. Chapter 23, Mel The wedding of Brandy and Nathan Hill went off without a hitch. Or maybe I should say with a hitch since they got hitched. They were dancing and eating and celebrating their sacred union of till death do them part, 
and reveling in the merriment along with family, friends, and well-wishers. I stood before a microphone trying to control my pout reflex as I witnessed yet another wedding reception. Another loving couple was fawning over each other while I stood with a gaping wound where my heart used to be. Nathan couldn't take his eyes off his new bride, and while I sang Christina Perry's A Thousand Years, Brandy and Nathan danced their first dance as Mr. and Mrs. They were a beautiful couple. I forced my eyes closed so I could make it through the song. It was getting harder and harder to pretend I wasn't dying inside during our wedding gigs. Time should have eased the pain. Instead, I felt as though the pain grew roots and was taking permanent hold over me. The song came to an end, and as I opened my eyes to watch the last moment of the dance, movement in the crowd caught my eye. For a brief moment, I thought I saw Mac. My heart leaped, then sank when my brain reminded me it wasn't him. There was no way it could be Mac. As soon as the song ended, I turned to Pierce and motioned for him to sing. The father-daughter dance was next, and he could handle singing their song choice without a problem. I needed a break. Pierce didn't look concerned, which was weird for him. Instead, he just smiled and nodded. Stepping off the stage and out of the ballroom, I made my way outside and sucked in fresh air. Hands on my hips, I bent over and tried to slow my breathing. How crazy. Panting, practically having a panic attack, all because I imagined for a moment I saw Mac. What did I even think was going to happen? My hopeful brain was foolishly imagining a scenario where Mac showed up at a random wedding because he came for me. Like that, whatever happen. The door opened behind me and I straightened up. I didn't want anyone else to know how much of a wreck I was. With my back turned to the door, the hair on the back of my neck stood straight up and a warm sensation washed down my spine. Hello, Mel. Oh no, my blood sugar. I was hallucinating. Although I didn't feel lightheaded or dizzy. No nausea. I jerked around, and there he was. Mac, the man who'd stolen every conscious thought I'd had for the last couple of weeks. I'd gone through this moment a thousand times in my head. Lying in bed at night, I'd planned whole conversations of what I would say if he showed up. None of them came to mind now that it was finally happening. I was tongue-tied. Mac's eyes moved over my face and down my body. They settled somewhere in the middle, and he frowned. You've lost weight. I hugged my middle, shrinking into myself. You're still incredibly beautiful. Why are you here? He stepped closer and tried to touch me, but I stepped back. With a sigh, he rubbed his hand over his head. His hair had grown a little longer and looked more unkempt than it had been. There are a few things I need to say to you. I steeled myself. I'm listening. There's something very important. Can we go somewhere and talk? Um, we can talk here, can't we? He grunted. Fine. I crossed my arms over my chest and backed up a few steps. I was fighting my body's instinct to throw myself into his arms and beg him to give us another chance. I miss you. I think you miss me too, and if so, I owe you an apology and an explanation. My heart leaped into my throat. He stared down at me with such intensity. Under his gaze, I felt like chocolate melting in the hot sun. What are you talking about? You know what I am. Well, there's something that comes with being a shifter. He looked uncomfortable. We have mates. Like soulmates. One person on the face of this planet meant solely for us. It's a very special bond, one that grows stronger with time. Many shifters look forward to finding their mates, even go looking for them. It's finding your best friend and the person you're most sexually attracted to all in one. There's an instant connection that can't be denied, no matter what. No matter if the other person already has a boyfriend 
or if they're only there on vacation and leaving to go home in just a few days. My pulse raced. What exactly are you saying? Sometimes, one of the mates makes a mistake and doesn't think things through. I frowned. You're my mate, Melody. I knew the moment I saw you in that tree that you were mine. He came closer. I held up a hand. I was having trouble processing what he was saying. I don't understand. If we are what you say we are, mates, mates, why would you abandon me at the hospital? And again, after I almost drowned. He ran a hand through his hair and blew out a harsh breath. I was scared. Of what? You're human, Mel. Fragile. Compared to humans, shifters are tough. Our cells regenerate and adapt at an alarming rate. Shifters don't get human illnesses or diseases. Physically, we're ten times as strong. If we're injured, we heal quickly. He cleared his throat. My sister, Heather, her mate is human. They're the reason I moved to Sunkiss Key, to help take care of him. Her human mate is fighting cancer. He's been in chemo for a while and he's sick. I felt a lump forming in my throat and shook my head. I am so sorry. Mates don't function well without each other, especially if they've been together for a long time. Heather is suffering too. The sicker Warren gets, the more she hurts. Mac looked away and blew out a rough breath. I was scared that if anything happened to you, that I wouldn't be okay. I nodded. And I ended up in the hospital, and then I almost drowned. Mel, I knew the moment I laid eyes on you that you were mine. I screwed up, and I have no right to ask but I'm hoping you'll at least give me a chance to prove to you that I want you. I promise you that if you just give me a chance, I'll spend the rest of my life making it up to you and trying to be the man you deserve. At the risk of sounding cliche, you complete me. I couldn't believe this was happening. Tears filled my eyes. My voice broke. At the risk of sounding cliche, you had me at hello. Chapter 24, Mac. Mel returned to the stage. Every time she sang, she looked through the crowd, spotted me, and her eyes lit up. She sang as though she was singing right to me. I was one lucky son of a bitch. As I stood near the edge of the large, festive wedding reception, I decided I wanted to marry Mel in a big wedding. Shifters didn't normally have wedding ceremonies, but humans did. I'd discuss it with Mel, of course, but if she wanted a ceremony like this, she'd have it, with all our family and friends in attendance. I'd left Am with a table of older ladies who treated us both as though we were blood relatives. I'd explained my reason for crashing the wedding and what I had been hoping to accomplish. They were in on the whole thing, insisting I leave Am with them while I approached Mel. Aunt Nancy, Aunt Deb, Grandma Ruth, and Nana Linda were still doting on Am when I returned to their table. Am, who had been a fussy beast for two straight weeks, calmed as we boarded our flight to Syracuse. The closer we got to Mel, she became more and more of her sweet self. It was ridiculous, but it really seemed almost as though she knew. The reception ended, the band was packing up. There were still guests milling around, but the lights had come up. I made small talk with the older ladies, got my cheeks pinched and padded, and even my biceps squeezed, before strapping Am into the special baby carrier that I wore over my suit. It'd taken me a minute or twenty to figure it out, but it was only slightly harder than donning full firefighting gear. When we got close enough to see Mel descending the stairs leading from the stage, her long black dress cascading down her body, Am let out an ear-splitting howl. Mule! 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 Her chubby arms stretched as far as they could, and her little fists clenched and unclenched, grasping for Mel. Huh? 
Maybe Am had been saying Mel after all. Mel gasped. Am, you brought the baby. From too far away in front of too many people, I called to her. Marry me, Mel. Her head snapped up and her mouth gaped at me. I smiled down at Am as the baby squealed and went crazy. She practically climbed out of the carrier and launched herself at Mel. She wanted her so badly. Mel worked on unstrapping Am from the carrier. Marry me. Please. Mel held Am against her chest and just stared at me. Her friend Ingrid came up beside me and scowled. Get on your knee, you tallywhacker. I nodded. Right. Mel's jaw dropped. On one knee in front of her, I looked up and smiled. Mel, we were made for each other. I'll spend the rest of our lives showing you that. Will you marry me? She suddenly smacked me on the shoulder with the back of her hand and growled in the cutest way at me. Are you crazy? Get up. Say yes and I will. Pierce and Ben shook their heads. This is embarrassing. Ingrid hushed them and put her hands on her hips. Now don't be rude, Mel. Mel scoffed. Are you in on this? Ben might have mentioned something about this happening. I might have supported it. Mel, I drew her attention back to me. What'll it take to get you to say yes to me? She bounced Am on her hip and pressed her lips to Am's little head. Are you sure? Someone in the crowd behind us, I think it was Aunt Nancy, yelled, Say yes or I will. Mel looked around, realizing for the first time we had an audience. She blushed furiously and then moved closer to me. Everyone cheered and Am's swinging fist was too close to my head. After taking a solid punch to the side of the head, I stood and looked down at my little sparring partner and then at my mate. There's one more thing, Mel frowned. What? I have taken over parenting Am, forever. I shook my head. Jenny signed her parental rights away and I'm going to adopt her. We're a package deal. Mel blinked away tears and cupped Am's head. Are you using this baby to lure me in? I won't say it's beneath me. Mel stroked my jaw with her free hand. Yes, I will marry you, both. I wrapped my two girls in my arms, the luckiest man in the entire world. Mel took a deep breath and looked up at me, tears streaming down her face. I'm going to be a wife and a mom, finally. Epilogue, Mel. Everyone seated, we're ready to begin. Ingrid smiled warmly as her eyes surveyed me approvingly. Coming, one more glance at my makeup, and I couldn't contain the grin that spread across my face. It was finally coming true. This was what I'd wanted for so long. All those years ago when I'd given up fame and the spotlight in favor of a normal life as a non-celebrity, this was what I'd had in mind. I was beginning to think it would never happen. Aren't you glad you didn't settle? I just smiled and picked up the bouquet of wildflowers from the side table. Outside the tent we'd had erected for the occasion, my brother and Ben stood waiting for me. Don't be nervous, little sis. It's going to be perfect. Pierce kissed my forehead. He's right, it is. Ingrid clasped my hand and squeezed. I'm going to take my seat, but here. She tucked a tissue in my fist. I brought a whole box. Pierce was on my left and Ben on my right. As the recorded wedding march began, the three of us took the first step down the aisle toward the gazebo on the beach, under which Hamish, McGregor, and I would say our vows. For weeks I'd been fielding jokes from those two about how they might just give me away to the highest bidder, but today, their faces held proud, pleased, but serious expressions. My engagement ring glinted in the sun and I wore a flowy pale blue sundress for our beach wedding. My future sister-in-law and brother-in-law were in the front row. Warren had donated his wheelchair to charity a month ago, no longer having a use for it, 
and was in full remission. Am was on Heather's lap, dressed in a frilly, pale blue dress I'd had made to match mine. It was easily the happiest I could ever remember being. Well, it was a close tie with the day Mac and I signed the adoption papers, making Amethyst Isabel McGregor our daughter. We weren't opposed to having more children, but my age and my diabetes lowered my fertility rate. If it happened, it happened. If not, we were more than content with our family of three. I'd been nervous about today, but surprisingly, it was Mac who calmed me last night and assured me that our lives together were meant to be and that everything was going to be imperfectly perfect. The moment I spotted him, my lungs froze and my breath caught. Mac was standing under the gazebo that Parker, Layla, and Mariah had draped with flowy white fabric and clusters of floral sprays. A flutter rushed through me, the way it always did when I looked at him. My mate was incredibly handsome, in his light gray linen pants and bright white button-down shirt. Mac said a few words to the wedding officiant, then his smiling face nodded at his firefighting buddies seated in the crowd. As he turned and spotted me, his grin was replaced with a look so intense, so filled with adoration, there was absolutely no doubt the man was in love with me. I was sure my cheeks blushed bright red, and I averted my gaze to the ground as the three of us continued our slow walk to the gazebo. It was going to be interesting having wolf shifters for a husband and a daughter, but there was no one on earth I'd rather go through life with than those two. The guests had all eyes focused on me as I slowly walked past the chairs that were set up in the sand on either side of the aisle. Parker wiggled her fingers in a mini wave. I'd promised her a written testimonial from Melody Maines for her website, since she was taking all the credit for our pairing. Ingrid waggled her eyebrows and gave me two thumbs up. The ceremony itself was short and sweet, and throughout, I used the tissue from Ingrid to gently wipe away tears that I couldn't keep from falling. Afterward, we all met up at Mimi's cabana to celebrate. I still maintained that Sunkiss Key was a magical place. At least it was for Mac and me and our family. We had everything. Signed adoption papers, a framed marriage certificate, and we'd even acquired a cat that Am just adored. He'd been a stray that showed up at our door one day and never left. A tree-climbing calico we named Walter. The End this was the last book in the Cybermates series by Candace Ayers. Keep your eyes open on Audible for more series and more books by Candace Ayers to be published soon. Thank you for listening. This has been Craved Mate, Wolf Shifter Rom-Com Romance, Book 6 in the Cybermates series. Written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Maeve York.